This lecture will be about the absorption of drugs. Uh, we'll be talking about a lot of different types of absorption. Okay, but uh, the first part of the lecture um, is going to be, part one is going to be biopharmaceutics. We've already talked about biopharmaceutics, but this will go into more depth on that. And then the second part um, is going to be physiological factors in absorption. And of course, we'll be going back to our a lot of our gastrointestinal physiology that we learned about in our ANP course. Okay, so my learning objectives will be separated um, for each section coming up or each part. So section one is biopharmaceutics. And we're going to be talking about, about bioavailability very briefly. Um, I have a whole lecture on bioavailability and bioequivalence at the end of my portion of the course. So be brief uh, for bioavailability. And then, and then drug product design, drug product testing, in vitro in vivo correlations, in the biopharmaceutics classification system. BCS is something that will be more important if you end up working in industry um, to be familiar with that terminology. Um, and I'm, you won't get into that now, but these are the, the main topics that we'll be covering throughout this section. Learning objectives um, for the biopharmaceutics section are to describe the biopharmaceutic factors affecting drug design, define rate limiting step, and relate to bioavailability of a drug, differentiate between solubility and dissolution. Um, those are interesting terms. You, I don't know that you've thought about the difference yet. Uh, differentiate between drug absorption and bioavailability. Describe tests used to evaluate drug products. Um, and just, and I'm not going to go into great depth on this. You might have seen this in pharmaceutics, or you will. But list the USP dissolution apparatus and describe. Uh, what drug products would be applicable for using that apparatus to test dissolution. Again, that'll be pretty brief. Define in vitro and vivo correlation and explain why a level A correlation is most important. Explain by the biopharmaceutical classification system or BCS and you know what each classification means really in terms of solubility, dissolution, and, and uh, permeation um, in the gastrointestinal membrane. So I'm going to define bioavailability now, and again, we're going to go into much greater depth in a later lecture. But bioavailability is the, the rate and extent of active drug that becomes available at the intended site of action. So most of us think of bioavailability as, um, if you, you know, I don't know if you thought of it before, but um, commonly it's just thought of as when you swallow a drug or it's oral, and then it gets absorbed into the blood. Yeah, that's bioavailability. Uh, but it, it could also be, you know, a topical drug. It could be a different uh, administration route. It doesn't have to be oral to still, um, again, talk about bioavailability. That's still applicable. For oral formulations, again, we, we usually use plasma to determine bioavailability. So how much active ingredient got into the plasma or serum. Oral drug absorption involves three steps. Um, obviously, drug release from the drug product. Um, you don't absorb a whole tablet, right? You have to absorb most drugs on a monomolecular level that means they have to be dis, uh, dissolved as single molecules so it takes time you know for that to happen so that's the first step then movement of the drug across the gastrointestinal barrier which would be where the you know the enterocytes are we're usually talking about enterocytes or the small intestine there and then into the portal vein blood and and that's in most cases not in all cases drugs will go to the portal vein first survival of the drug or active metabolite in the face of GI and liver metabolism and transport. Yeah, so believe it or not, the intestines can metabolize in some cases. And of course, the liver metabolizes drugs. So, you know, for the drug to be effective and reach its target, it has to survive, to some extent, survive metabolism um, or be activated by metabolism, right? It depends on the type of drug. For locally acting products, uh, bioavailabil bioavailability would just be the free drug movement into the target tissue, dermis, ocular fluid, wherever it is, you know, if it's, again, if it's um, inhalational, then we're just, we're just, you know, bioavailability is almost guaranteed if you're just treating the lung tissue. Um, but that would still be considered bioavailability if, if the drug gets from the alveolar fluid into its target, which might be inside the, inside the epithelial cells there, for example. So the biopharmaceutical factors in drug product design um, are here. So bioavailability is determined by the drug product and patient physiology. 
Okay, so the drug itself, of course the way it's formulated will have a, a dramatic effect in some cases on the bioavailability and then patient physiology is critical. You need to understand that um, certain certain situations like slow bowel movements, um, bowel resections and sur uh, surgical procedures that a patient has, have, has gone through might affect bioavailability of course. Okay, and that's you know, not something you normally see in, in, in any guidelines or, or um, the package insert, but it's something you need to understand, of course, it's going to be relevant um, in that case. So excipients can influence bioavailability, right? So we talked about that briefly in the intro lecture. Um, actually, it might have be, been longer than, than brief, but excipients are, the, of course, are the inactive ingredients. And... You know anything in the in the list of excipients in a tablet or capsule that might influence absorption because they might influence you know is the drug charged is it um, is it uncharged um, how fast do the excipients allow the drug to dissolve or disintegrate etc cetera, etc cetera. common drug products include liquids cap uh, tablets capsules injectable suppositories transdermals topical creams ointments gels so those are the main types of things that you, you know most of you probably heard the major biopharmaceutical factors in drug product design are route of administration. Okay, so the, the design of a drug product might change based on the route of administration, of course. Again, a simple example, we don't put tablets um, in the rectal area. We would use a suppository or a cream or something like that that's already um, ready to, to melt or dissolve. Uh, physical chemical properties of the drug product. Um, are really going to be important in determining how we how we need to formulate it. The type of dosage form will determine how we formulate it. Um, if it's going to be a tablet, we have other considerations than if it's a capsule or a or a cream or something like that. Nature of the excipients in the drug product. Okay, so that would um, and we'll get into all the details on these, but that's going to be a relevant factor. And then the method of manufacturing um, might change based on um, of course, the dosage form and the route of administration, things like that. Um, so, route of administration, I'm going to focus on for now. Just to, I'm going to focus on a few of those topics, those those factors. So, route of administration, I'm going to talk about locally acting first. Um, locally acting drugs should ideally avoid systemic systemic absorption. So, if you want to treat your skin or you want to treat your eyes. Um, with an eye drop or something, usually you do not want systemic absorption, right? So sometimes they're intentionally designed to avoid systemic uh, absorption. Sometimes um, just by you know serendipity, they're just not absorbed because the amount you're putting at the the local site is low enough that even if it you know even if it gets absorbed, it's diluted significantly, so it's not a problem in most cases. Um, there are some strange examples or interesting ones. So there are colon targeted drugs. So even though the colon is inside the body, it's in a sense it's topical because it's not getting into the blood um, if you if you bypass the small intestine. So the colon target is locally acting but orally administered. Um, there are drugs that do not disintegrate or dissolve until they reach the colon, and that's strictly based on the excipients and uh, usually the, of course the coating of the drug in many cases. Eye drops or ointment or ophthalmic. Um, those, of course, those are locally acting, and and you know those have to be formulated appropriately to to treat whatever condition you're treating. It all depends. Um, sometimes ointments are, are necessary for for lubricating the eye. Sometimes drops are necessary to dissolve to have a pre-dissolved um, treatment for you know it could be for eye allergies or redness. Um, ear drops are, are considered otic, of course, intranasal. And intranasal could very, in many cases, um, very easily get into the blood. So that's a, a really important consideration. Anything that's given intranasally, we need to understand and they need to test how much of it gets into the blood uh, before it's marketed. Inhal inhalationals are usually intended to work locally, but of course you can get systemic exposure and that's why patients that um, inhale um, beta-2 agonist drugs uh, like albuterol or salmeterol or promoterol and then there's some new ones that I'm forgetting some new the the beta agonist but those 
can sometimes cause tachycardia and systemic effects. So that's something that's really, it's going to be important to for the companies to characterize that and hopefully try to minimize that if the intention is just local um, action. And then the, another route, um, well, you have several routes to um, achieve systemic action. So in the bloodstream. Systemically acting drugs would be first parenteral. Technically parenteral means outside of the GI tract, but it usually means injectable. So IV is 100% bioavailability, of course, because if, the, if we're defining bioavail, bioavailability by um, appearance in the plasma, of course, 100% of the drug will appear in the plasma if you inject it. So there's no, no first pass effect in that case as well. That means the drug does not go to the liver before it goes to all the other organs. IM or intramuscular is right in the muscle tissue. There's no first pass effect, but usually much slower absorption because it doesn't, well, it's not going directly into the blood, right? It's going into the interstitial tissue. IP is intraperitoneal. Um, one of the, the more important things in my opinion, um, and I want you to, to know this, is that intraperitoneal in most cases will have a first pass effect in all cases that I'm aware of actually, but, but intraperitoneal is, is where you inject a drug into the abdominal cavity. Um, you don't, you're not trying to inject an, an organ, but you're trying to put it in the fluid in the ab abdomen, um, where all your organ, your, um, visceral organs are present in that fluid in the peritoneal cavity surrounding those organs. So all those abdominal organs have capillaries that will absorb this IP formulation or this IP injection. And those capillaries, because they're all abdominal organs, they all travel to the portal vein as if you swallow the drug. So um, IP is the only parental route that's really going to be, be looking similar to oral um, with respect to first pass metabolism. Transdermal products have systemic targets. Um, and that's very important to understand that just because something is on the skin doesn't mean it's only treating the skin. Of course, transdermal, that means all the way through the dermis. That's a very deep penetration through the skin. So that's going to go into the bloodstream. Fentanyl is an easy one. That's a patch. Um, obviously, for systemic pain or pain somewhere else in the body than, than on the skin in many cases. So, so transdermal is very different from topical. I want you to understand that. Um, topical means it's only treating the surface of the skin or something on the skin. And transdermal is systemic. So oral mucosa can be used for systemic action. And I want to emphasize or clarify that doesn't mean swallowing it. That means the mucous membrane in your mouth. So the cheeks under the tongue. So the cheek would be buccal administration under the tongue is sublingual. Nitroglycerin is used sublingually for chest pain. Um, and you have to have Right? You have to have very rapid absorption if you have chest pain, and that's what the, the sublingual administration will achieve, is very rapid absorption um, for, for the, as long as it's designed appropriately with the proper formulation. Each route, um, and again, this, this whole slide here is on product design. Each route requires a special product design. The eye, eye drops must not interfere with corneal physiology and pH. Okay, the pH of the eye is going to be important. Um, the corneal physiology, particularly with um, your fluid secretions onto the cornea to uh, maintain hydration, you don't really want to interfere with that in, in many cases, right? In almost any case. And I know that's even more of a concern with contact lens wearers, which I'm not, fortunately, but I, I know enough about it that it's a common problem in contact lens wearers. And, um, getting dry eye and, and you know any drug that would make that worse of course would be a problem so they have to consider that um, in the product design what, what excipients are in there and how, how is that going to affect eye physiology tears are aqueous those could wash away with hydrophilic medications okay so and that's not a huge concern but what it means is that um, you know the tear the tears are important in, in some respects because they do have antimicrobial components, believe it or not. The tears have, um, what is it called? I'm trying to think 
um, lysozyme, which breaks down um, bacterial membranes. So tears are not just it, you know just fluid, just it, like saline. They do have other things in them, and one of those is antimicrobials. So, so it's not it's not necessarily something you always avoid, but just be aware of that 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 washing away the tears with something else, you know, it has some effects on on the the purpose of those tears. So intramuscular drugs, um, a drug must not irritate muscle tissue. So you have, you know, the, only certain drugs are able to be administered IM without causing um, muscle damage or muscle irritation. A drug must diffuse adequately from the muscle interstitial fluid. So the size of the molecules is going to be important in IM delivery. Too large, maybe very slow absorption. Um, very small, might be very rapid absorption. So, you know, we have all these different formulations for IM, um, different molecule sizes, but then also suspensions and things like that to to prolong the absorption if that's the goal. Uh, suspensions must have sus a specific particle size to ensure appropriate absorption timing. This this is really important. So, you know, if, if and there are many um, intramuscular suspensions and, and um, emulsions and things like that, but the suspensions, um, if the particle size is not uniform, then patient to patient variability will exist and even even injection to injection variability would exist. And and for instance, if you double the particle size, um, it will most likely have an exponential impact on the absorption and slowing down the slowing down the bioavailability, right? The larger the particle size because of the lesser surface area. So it's really important to understand that um, the, the companies that are producing these have to ensure uniformity in the particle size in the suspensions and and that means yeah it's, it's solid it's a solid that's suspended in, in a liquid and they're injecting that right into the muscle in some cases and that it's got to be very consistent so dose expression um, the way the dose is expressed might change it does change based on the route of administration believe it or not I don't know if, it's not something that most people would have thought about probably at this point, but um, it's it's actually kind of interesting if you think about it. So topical creams um, are usually listed as percent active drug, 0.5% hydrocortisone, for example, because the total mass of the drug applied will vary by patient technique. And that, I mean, that's, I just added that um, last, the second half of that, because <clears throat> I was just kind of brainstorming about, so why would, why would it make more sense to to not you're not listing it as of course you're not listing it as milligrams per dose or milligrams um, like let me clarify so if you're in a tablet it's consistent milligrams each time whereas if you have a cream it's going to vary every single time so they can't really of course they can't list it by um, you know consistent milligrams for every dose um, because the patient's going to vary. Each time they apply it, it's going to be a slightly different amount, maybe even dramatically different amount, depending on how they do it. So they, ha they have to list it by just percent active ingredient rather than just, just mass, right? It's not just the mass, it's not just milligrams. It's a concentration or percent. Um, orally administered drugs are usually a specified mass, right? Milligrams, micrograms, etc. cetera. Um, Over-the-counter drugs have the same recommended dose for all adults, so this last, um, and I just want to clarify, and I don't know if I've done this before, but anything I have in blue, at least I tried my best to consistently put um, the questions that I have um, in blue. Um, I think they're all in blue. Um, and then I use green in many cases for the answer. And I might have switched that depending on the slideshow, not, but I tried to be consistent for most of them. Um, but anyway, the, color, the colors indicate that it's a question. Um, so over-the-counter drugs have the same recommended dose for all adults. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but if you go to the drugstore, you'll find naproxen or whatever you're looking at, ibuprofen, and it's, it tells you the, the recommended dose for an adult. Well, some adults are twice the weight of other adults, but you're still getting the same, they're still, they're still recommending the same amount. And the question is, why might this be a problem for some patients? And, and I think the answer is obvious, right? So, um, some patients will have um, a subtherapeutic concentration of these things like NSAIDs because they're heavier. Some patients will have potentially a, 
a higher level than they need because they're lighter but most of them are designed um, conservatively so they're going to minimize side effects so what that means is if someone is a little bit larger there's a, there's a pretty good chance that they're not going to experience relief at the normal dosage and it all depends on how the drug is distributed throughout the body and that is a separate lecture that we'll talk you know we'll get into that in much greater depth but um, it's it's a real serious in my opinion a serious issue with over-the-counter drugs that they're never dosed based on body weight okay of course when you're pediatric um, they do change the dosing recommendation but other than that they it's totally you know regardless of your body weight here's the dose you take so it's very crude in a sense um, those recommendations so physical chemical properties of the drug product ideal physical chemical properties of a drug product will differ depending on the administration route and goal um, that means you know is it is it ionized is it unionized is it lipophilic is it hydrophilic well those you know those choices when you're making a drug and hopefully there's a choice that you can modify those or, or some freedom to modify those well you might want to you might want to do that um, and modify those different ways depending on the route of administration and the goal of treatment okay so if we want you know more rapid absorption maybe we'll go with something more hydrophobic um, things like but we won't get into that too much now because that's um, that's coming later but um, IV solutions require water soluble formulations with adequate stability and solution so this is a real problem in, in hospital settings and things that um, you, know, you don't you don't want to give a patient an IV suspension right it's always an IV solution but a lot of drugs are, are um, just inherently unstable once they're in solution because they can hydrolyze they can get hydrolyzed they're sensitive to light and things like that so in solution it's it's a you know the very it's a very um, big problem with stability um, but they you know IV solutions require things to be water soluble so you know you don't really see a lot of IV solutions of very lipophilic things and if you do they're they might be more complicated they might be dissolved in a lipid um, rather than being dissolved in water things like that unstable drugs might require protective coatings in the stomach and that's that's the obvious um, enteric coating story um, things like Prilosec or Nexium um, are good examples where the the drug is protected from the stomach and they have to have a special coating um, and that's that's because the the actual product is um, unstable in acid or act or in, in Prilosec and Nexium's case they're um, activated prematurely in the acid but but you can say they're unstable for the most part and that would be good enough in most cases so the actual physical chemical properties that are important are um, they're all here uh, the, the major ones uh, pKa of a drug or excipient may influence stability solubility and absorption and in most cases um, at least two of those things are affected right at least absorption and solubility so obviously um, from biochemistry you might remember pKa um, is going to tell you at what pH a substance will be ionized or unionized depending on if it's an acid or a base you know usually it's a weak acid or a weak base so we're going to get into that we, we are going to get into the Henderson Hasselbach equation which I know you you're probably all big fans of right and that's sarcasm but um, just a little bit on the Henderson Hasselbach equation and, and I might I might have you do a couple calculations on that but the pKa of the drug um, is going to be you know it's going to be influence it may influence stability um, and that be, that's because you know some drugs are acid stable some drugs are base stable um, or the opposite right they're they're sensitive to acids or sensitive to bases and things like that and sometimes that's because of their pKa um, because they're they're going to be um, you know protonated or deprotonated depending on the the pH solubility um, it's that's the easy one right so the more charged something is the more water soluble right so that's going to depend on pKa and the absorption um, the, there's usually more rapid absorption if something is non-charged or unionized okay particle size 
will affect dissolution rate. We talked about this. Smaller is faster dissolution, of course. So if you have the exact same mass, so you know, 10 milligrams of one drug versus 10 milligrams, well, 10 milligrams of the same drug but a different particle size, right? So if you double the particle size but have the same total mass, um, you will slow down the dissolution because most of that will be inaccessible to the water, right? The larger it is, the less that will be accessible to the water for dissolution because of the surface area. Different crystal structures or polymorphs of the active pharmaceutical ingredient will have different solubilities. Um, this is something that I never would have thought of in school, um, at least not very much. And then later on, um, I did some research on the in this area um, in, at UConn in 2001. Um, did a fellowship there while I was a, a PharmD student at Wilkes. Um, I learned a lot more about this, and it, and I put, that was my first publication. And what we learned is is um, or what I learned at least at the time was that um, whether or not a drug is in its crystal form or a non-crystal form, which is considered amorphous, that will that will change the dissolution rate and even the total solubility. So sometimes crystal forms are less soluble and have slower dissolution than the amorphous form. Um, so it's really interesting um, when you think about it. So believe it or not, when it when they're synthesizing a drug in a company, um, they they can't just ignore these things. They can't just say, well, okay, I've confirmed that that drug is pure and it's the right amount, so we're done. No, then you have to know, you know, is it is it crystal form A, B, C? Is it amorphous? And how does that affect the solubility and dissolution rate? So believe it or not, these things are really important in the in the formulation realm. Partition coefficient or log P. Um, I don't I'm not, I don't know how much you've learned about this yet, but it just means um, Right, they they basically put the drug, um, does, they dissolve it and put it in a mixture of octanol and water. Right, octanol and water, um, they don't mix, they separate. So the amount of the drug that goes into the octanol will tell you how lipophilic it is. So the more that goes into the octanol, the more lipophilic. The more that goes into the water, the more hydrophilic. And the reason why they do that is um, because it's a good predictor of how fast it'll absorb. Um, across the the you know intestinal membrane once it is dissolved. Chirality, stereoisomerism may affect drug pharmacodynamics. Um, so yeah, when they're synthesizing a drug, they have to know is it is it racemic? Um, is it enantiopure? Is it just one? Of, so is it just one of the enantiomers? And does that matter? In many cases, it does matter. It may affect. Um, whether or not it's going to bind to the, the receptor or it may affect metabolism. Uh, in many cases, the which which enantiomer you're giving. And that's the example is like uh, Prilosec or Omeprazole came out first and then Esomeprazole or Nexium came out later. And th the Esomeprazole was, I don't remember if it was better metabolism or better uh, pharmacodynamic or, or uh, targeting effects, but either way, um, they considered it better um, because of that being an antiopure. So here's an example of um, how a pKa will influence the solubility of, of a real drug at different pHs. This is carvedilol. It's a beta blocker that's often used for heart failure. Um, it's been out there for quite a while now. Um, I think you, the brand name used to be Coreg, and I don't know if it still is used, C-O-R-E-G. But carvedilol has a pKa of 7.8. Um, and by the way, a lot of drugs are weak bases. See the amine, the amine there, um, this amine on the left is, of course, that, that's a weak, it's a weak basic functional group. And a lot of, a lot of drugs are weak bases. Um, I'd say, and I, I don't have the numbers on this, but I think less of them are actually weak acids. Okay, and some of them are zwitter ions, so they could be both, but carvedilol has this weak basic group and anytime you have a weak base, and I don't know if you remember this from your previous courses, but again, anytime you have a weak base, which is um, for the purpose of this course, anytime you see an amine there, it's almost in most cases it's going to be a weak base. But when that um, when you drop the pH below that drug's pKa, you will protonate it, right, or you will um, charge it. So and that's why I have here acid. If you add acid 
which would lower the pH, that would protonate it. If you add base, you'll deprotonate it. And when this, when a weak base like this is protonated, it is positively charged because that amine is going to have um, total of four bonds, so it's positively charged. So how does that affect the actual? Um, uh, this would actually be solubility and dissolution rate, and I'll show you what I mean in a, in a second here. So if you look at um, again tablets of corvetolol, or just the powder, I'm not sure which one they used, but they um, they looked over time, and they found that when the pH was the top here, that's the lower pH, right? And if we look on the on this image that I made here, the lower pH, right, would be more acid. And more specifically, if we look at the pKa, that's 7.8. And if we're a whole pKa, a whole pH unit below the pKa, then the vast majority of it, and I, I think it was probably 99%, but I don't remember, and we'll get into that calculation soon, but the vast majority of it will be in this protonated form in this acid because we're, we're and this is, remember this is logarithmic, the pH and the pKa scale, so we're really, really protonating most of it. So most of it should be more soluble. So what you see is that not only does it dissolve quicker, which is shown by the, the slope of this curve, it also reaches at the very end when it's starting to get flat, the total solubility is higher. So the total amount dissolved is also higher. So it's faster and it is more dissolved in the end. So if we go in the middle, um, still acidic relative to the pKa of corvetolol, we do some, find some intermediate. And then when we go um, the exact same pH as the drug's pKa, 50% of it should be charged and 50% of it should be uncharged. And that'll give us, um, you know, all that uncharged drug will be much lower solubility. So the total solubility is lower. And then the, dis the dissolution rate or the slope is going to be lower. So um, it's a really, really significant effect um, on solubility, which then right has to dissolve to be absorbed. So that ultimately affects bioavailability. Um, and again, no one's going to memorize pKa's for every drug. But the most important thing is to understand why pH matters and how, you know, if someone has a different pH in their GI tract, how that, you know, may affect drug absorption in general, that, that it can affect drug absorption, right? And then you would look into each drug. Um, if you have a real patient, look into the drug and see, well, what are the guidelines on that? If someone has, you know, is, is there, is there, um, a contraindication if, uh, if someone's on acid suppressive therapy or or should I modify the dose and sometimes the answer is yes you might see that in the package insert for example so we just talked about pKa so what about this whole idea of the crystal form that we talked about and this is this is the, the example I wanted to use chloramphenicol is a drug that's an antibiotic it's still um, used uh, from time to time so chloramphenicol is existing in at least two different crystal forms. Um, there's something called the alpha form and something called the beta form or beta polymorph. And it's actually chloramphenicol palmitate. So it's a, a salt, a salt with this um, this kind of small acid, fatty acid. But that has two crystal forms. And if you look at this uh, chart here, or this graph, you'll see that if we give 100% um, beta polymorph, which is, all that means is the, the crystal is in a different structure, different shape, so the molecules are arranged differently in the crystal, but they're, you know, in repeating units, and that's why it's called a crystal, but, but they're arranged differently, three-dimensionally. So what happens is if you give 100% beta polymorph, you actually get a higher absorption, right, after dosing, you get a higher bioavailability, uh, and this is, um, in the, the plasma concentration would be they're using micrograms per milliliter, so that's that's the concentration of plasma. But but after two hours, you can see how you know we're getting maybe 22 or something like that. But if we go down to zero B polymorph, and we if we have 100%, um, well I should say beta that was, but if we have 100% alpha, right, um, and none of the beta polymorph, we have very little absorption. So it's, it has a dramatic effect in this case. Um, and it's all the same drug. It's all the same molecule, the same amount. 
but just the crystal shape has an effect on absorption. So these are the little subtle details that you don't think about usually as a pharmacist, right? But, you know, if if someone, you know, a company, a generic company came out and they, without telling anyone, if they modified their method of, of manufacturing this, um, you know, again, without saying anything to the FDA, um, they might, you might get really serious differences in the efficacy for the patient or toxicity, right, for the patient. So it's really, really important um, for these things to be verified. And, and um, they have to prove that, you know, they're, they're consistent. Whatever, if, if the crystal polymorph matters, which it doesn't for every drug, but if it does matter, then they have to prove that they have consistency with the way they're producing that. And every time they produce it, they have about the same amount of that polymorph, especially if you're converting from brand to generic the the generic drug company must prove that at least that their bioavailability is the same and that's going to be dependent on that crystal. So I don't know if anyone's uh, familiar with this but um, most crystals out there have different hydration states and all that means is that when they when they they, they synthesize these drugs and then they purify them and then they crystallize, usually they crystallize when they're being purified when they crystallize them in a lot of cases, those crystals will permanently, kind of permanently incorporate water. And and that means the water is in the crystal, at least until you dissolve it. Okay, so the crystal will, will, will really adhere to that water, and it will become part of the structure. So the, the number of water molecules, or the hydration state of that drug, of the active pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical ingredient, can sometimes affect the solubility and the dissolution rate and um, I would think in most cases it's going to be the rate more than the the total solubility but the rates you know is going to be really important um, that's a really important factor right so if we have erythromycin dihydrate it's much more rapid dissolution if we have monohydrate or anhydrate okay it's going to be um, you know monohydrates in the in between anhydrate that means there's no water that means the, they, when they crystallized that drug, they did not incorporate any water whatsoever. They, so they removed it from the solution. And then it was just, you know, whatever the drug is crystallizing with, but there's zero water. So that's anhydrous, and that's a much slower um, dissolution. So it's really important for you to understand that these, um, you know, all these things matter. You know, pKa, what form of the crystal it is, and does it have... Um, waters of hydration in the crystal. Um, for some drugs it matters and other drugs it may not matter. For erythromycin it's really important. So for the next few slides we'll talk about how excipients can affect drug product performance. Um, they can actually influence the manufacturability. Um, things like you know how well the powder flows, does the powder bind together, um, things like that. Just simply the way the um, the way it's manufactured and, the, and how easy that is, okay, and how consistent that is. Um, stabilizing the active pharmaceutical ingredient, sometimes excipients can do that. Protecting the stomach, controlling the drug release so it is timed to be um, starting at the correct time and then um, for, for the correct duration of release. And then improving drug absorption in some cases. Some excipients may have both desirable and undesirable effects, so it's like a double-edged sword. And, um, and I'll show you that slide um, just in a few minutes. Um, but if you're looking at the PowerPoint and not the video, if you have you know just the PowerPoint file, you should be able to click on that link and it'll go to that slide and then and vice versa to come back to this slide. Common excipients in oral solid dosage forms are here. Um, there's going to be a bunch more, but these are the most common ones. And what is the purpose? Sometimes it's just to, um, as a diluent. So lactose might be added for a, if, a, if a drug is a pretty low mass, you know, micrograms or low milligrams, you might have to use a lot of lactose relative to the amount of drug just to make the tablet large enough to be able to handle it and, and, and maneuver it. Um, so just as a diluent. So starch is also a diluent and it helps to um, T to disintegrate the tablet when it is in in um, the stomach and things 
And once it's in that aqueous fluid, the starch can help with the disintegration rate. Uh, microcrystalline cellulose is also the same disintegrant diluent. Uh, magnesium stearate, which is magnesium is obviously um, a, di a divalent cation, and stearate is a short, kind of like small fatty acid. Um, so that's almost like a soapiness, or soapy kind of thing, so it's like lubricant. Um, hyd hydrogenated vegetable oil is also a lubricant. Talc is a lubricant. Um, and the lubricants are sometimes just, I mean, actually most times their purpose is in the, the actual, like, manufacturing. So using, ta um, sorry, blenders and, and grinders and things like that, um, having the lubricant there facilitates um, it allows the machine to work better without getting kind of blocked up. Um, so lubricants are sometimes for the, the sake of the manufacturing and not so much the, um, not so much related to the absorption in the body. Um, sucrose solution is, is going to facilitate or help to granulate something, right, to make something into a granular form. Cellulose acetate phthalate is one example of an enteric coating agent. It's a really common one. That is, um, it's placed on the surface of a drug, either on a, the surface of a tablet or the beads, might be on the surface of the beads inside of a capsule. And that, because of its chemistry, it only dissolves in neutral alkaline conditions. Um, so it protects the stomach or protects the drug from the stomach acid. If we're talking about oral liquid dosage forms, we have other excipients. Um, Sodium carboxymethylcellulose is for suspending, and all that means is it's going to allow the drug to stay suspended. So um, the last thing you want is, is the drug to all settle at the bottom of your suspension, um, and, then, and then someone tries to, to use it and they get nothing in the beginning, and then they get pure active ingredient in the end, or pure powder in the end. So, um, and yeah, you still have to mix your suspensions, but um, what you want to do is avoid rapid settling after you mix it. You want to avoid rapid settling of the, the powder. So this, this is what the purpose is here, to allow it to stay uh, in a suspension for a longer period of time. Um, so the patient has time to, you know, especially if it's a child and you're giving them like an amoxicillin suspension, you don't want to have to rush it, um, hoping that it doesn't settle. So tragacanth is a gum. It's also a suspending agent. Sodium alginate. Is that cool thing that's used to make like bubble tea and stuff to make the, the gel? That's a suspending agent. Um, that's from seaweed. Xanthan gum, very common food additive um, for a lot of different things as a thickener. That's a thixotropic suspending agent. Um, and that's just basically a thickener that allows the, uh, of course, allows the things to be suspended longer. Sorbitol and sucrose are sweeteners to make something more palatable. So it's not, you know, you're not tasting the bitterness in many cases of the, the drug um, active ingredient. So in many cases, most APIs are very, very bitter. Alcohol is a solubilizing agent and preservative. Um, you usually find alcohols in um, some cough syrups and things like that. Uh, propylene glycol is a solubilizing agent. Methyl and propylparaben, preservative. Corn and sesame oil, um, emulsion vehicles, so if something is very um, lipophilic, um, you might, you know, you might want to dissolve it, and that'll speed up absorption, but you might want to dissolve it, um, but still have it in a, a non, like a non-oily base, so what they would do is they, in some cases, they'll use a water base, and then a small oil droplets, uh, corn or, or sesame oil droplets, so it's still, um, the, the bulk of a fluid might be water, but we have small droplets of oil w which would contain the active ingredient in some cases. The effect of excipients on the peak uh, pharmacokinetics of oral drug products, are these are some examples here. So, and this is really important point, so why, um, how do excipients affect drug product performance? Um, so some of these are kind of like brand names, Avicel, Explotab, um, as you can tell for the name, maybe that this helps to um, disintegrate the tablet more rapidly and that and I haven't talked about this yet but the Ka is the rate constant for absorption so the higher that is the faster the absorption from um, in the GI tract 
So disintegrants, um, they, they force the tablet to break apart faster, which speeds up the absorption. And it, it makes the T-max um, shorter. So that all that means is that the time it takes to get to the maximum blood concentration is shorter. So it's much more rapid absorption and, and an earlier peak concentration. Talc, vegetable oil, or lubricants, even in, um, well, yeah, they're lubricants that can sometimes slow down the absorption rate um, and make it, you know, take it longer to get to the peak concentration. Um, cellulose acetate phthalate, remember that's the enteric coating. The reason why that reduces the KA is, be the KA is because when it gets into the stomach, right, it doesn't dissolve at all. So then when it gets in the small intestine, it's just starting to dissolve. So you're delaying the, the dissolution, which then delays and slows down the absorption. Okay, methylcellulose, ethylcellulose, they're I incorporated into solid dosage forms intentionally to make them take longer to dissolve um, and or disintegrate. So, and that's the purpose of them, for sustaining the release, for a longer absorption, um, a longer uh, absorption time Right, so instead of one or two hours, it might be three or four hours, and that what that'll do is reduce the the rate constant for absorption and make it take longer to get to the the peak concentration. Um, castor wax, carbo wax, um, those are sustained release agents. Um, they they do the same thing. Okay, so so I guess I don't want you I don't want you to memorize every single um, thing in this table, but I want you to understand that if something is a sustained release agent, meaning it's it's going to give you a longer, slower absorption, then of course it's going to slow or, or reduce the Ka or the absorption rate constant. It's going to reduce that Ka. And the time it takes to get the maximum blood concentration is going to be later, right? So a later Tmax or higher Tmax for anything that's sustained release. And then finally, uh, VGUM or Keltrol, those are also sustained release agents, so it does the same thing. So those last three um, really do the same thing, and it's to slow down the absorption. If you, if you don't want a spike in the blood, right, early on, if you want it more gradual and more controlled, then you would use one of these guys. So I mentioned earlier that some excipients can have both uh, positive and negative effects on drug product performance. Magnesium stearate, remember that is a lubricant, primarily helpful in, in the actual manufacturing process to um, kind of allow the machinery to work better, to not get kind of gummed up um, with, the, with the, the active ingredient and just allow it to, to flow better. But um, magnesium stearate is also hydrophobic and that kind of makes sense because the stearate is a fatty acid, somewhat hydrophobic. Um, that can limit wetting of the formulation, which will slow down dissolution. So think of it as like a kind of like an oily, um, oily tablet or oily, oily kind of solid that's in there um, in your GI tract. And if it is oily, it's going to take a lot longer to, to for any water to penetrate that because of the hydrophobicity. So if you look on the right here, you'll see that um, we have a low amount of magnesium stearate in the solid uh, dosage form. Um, we have not only a faster dissolution, but a higher percent. Um, we get 100% dissolved in, you know, maybe 30 minutes. But, you know, as we move higher and higher with the percent magnesium stearate, we have a slower dissolution. And I don't, you know, and they haven't gone out too far in the time here, but it looks like it's almost flattening, maybe even a lower dissolution. But ultimately that might have gone up to 100. But essentially the whole point is that it's a much slower dissolution in some cases. Um, if you have more of a, you know, this or that excipient and particularly hydrophobic excipients. So it's important to understand now that how excipients can affect um, solubility or dissolution um, and, and really a lot of other things. So one of the learning objectives was to really understand what the rate limiting steps um, in drug absorption are. Um, and so we're going to talk about that now for the next few slides. For oral immediate release formulations, which are um, really most drugs out there, um, certainly not all of them, but um, if you get a drug over the counter, uh, painkiller or something like that, usually they're 
they're released almost immediately um, as fast as possible and the most of them are oral so that's pretty common so the the rate limiting steps are disintegration and release from the drug or of the drug from the formulation so that means a tablet has to break apart right and and then it has to release that drug and in really the 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 drug is finally released on a, a monomolecular or single molecule level when it's actually dissolved right so we need disintegration then dissolution and of course something could be dissolved but not get absorbed so the final step is absorption across really the if you're talking oral it's usually um, enteric um, enterocyte cell membranes so the intestinal cell membranes into the systemic circulation and really that's usually the portal vein first and then the rest of the body um, after the liver um, so the slowest step in a series of any um, kinetic processes is called the rate limiting step uh, for drugs with poor solubility uh, the dissolution rate is often the slowest step um, and that exerts a rate limiting effect on drug bioavailability so what that means is that um, you know if something if you have a tablet and just imagine it disintegrates rapidly you know it breaks into smaller particles rapidly but then it's really really slow to dissolve um, so the, the whole point is that what's um, really dictating the absorption rate in that case is going to be the dissolution not as much as this the disintegration because the disintegration will be early and then you'll have a constant slow dissolution from those particles and that that's the case for any any of these you know if you had rapid dissolution and rapid disintegration before that but then slow absorption then the, the rate limiting step would be the absorption okay so the whole process is the drug is in the solid product then it disintegrates releases then you have solid drug particles then you have dissolution of, of the active ingredient and then you have absorption so any one of these could be slower than the others it depends on um, the active ingredient and the formulation so there's something called the USP or United States Pharmacopeia disintegration test which is required for oral solid dosage forms the drug product must disintegrate into small particles and release the drug okay so that's this step right here right in the beginning and there are many different devices that could be used for this but um, there are a few that are more common that we'll talk about uh, one in particular at least so um, the disintegration apparatus is usually pretty simple in this case it's a beaker that has kind of like a plastic usually acrylic or plastic chamber in it um, with a tablet and it has these plastic discs that will move up and down as the whole chamber kind of moves up and down in this it's kind of like a simulated physiological fluid or or GI fluid and then you'll you'll watch the tablet break apart and when the particles get small enough they can go through these um, pores in this 10 mesh screen and that's all you're really doing it's actually not it's not very sophisticated and in fact if you look and I don't think I'm going to read it but the the quote I have here is is so this is the actual definition um, the USP definition of complete disintegration and it doesn't mean um, the the solids are gone it means the solids are small and they're small um, and essentially um, it's broken apart completely where there's no solid mass um, and you don't have to memorize the, this statement here uh, specific parameters are set for the disintegration apparatus um, so you have to specify when you report to the FDA you have to specify the volume um, what is the pore size or the mesh type um, for you, this kind of screen the stroke rate and the depth right how fast and how how deep is this going to be up and down um, temperature etc cetera, etc cetera. all these things have to be standardized and usually usually it's it's you know body temperature a specific size beaker um, everything is, is standardized okay and you don't need to, to know all those details but you should understand that disintegration is one of the rate limiting factors and um, understand that you know that that is tested and it has to be uniform um, from you know tablet to tablet or or uh, whatever form you're talking about it's really typically tablets so this is what um, one of them I think we actually have one in one of our labs I think it's in uh, SLC 347 the last time I checked um, we have 
this kind of that can do like six tablets at the same time. Um, we we have all different kinds, but you know, out there in the world. Um, but basically, you'd you'd have this thing that would have um, like six chambers in it, and you'd have fluid in this beaker down here, and this would go up and down. The tablets would shake up and down, and they would break apart. So you'd have to have a little bit of um, a little bit of agitation, and also um, the water or the fluid itself would 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 permeate that and then bust it apart a little bit. Um, but this has to be controlled temperature, okay, and then everything else like the the rate and the depth and all that is controlled so not you know not from a pharmacology perspective not as exciting but still something that's really essential for testing drug products so we talked about disintegration um, the next uh, rate limiting step is dissolution um, and, and but I want to clarify the difference between dissolution and solubility again dissolution is the rate at which a drug dissolves so how many for instance, how many milligrams per minute or percent per minute, whereas solubility is, you know, once the drug stops dissolving, you know, where, when you're at that steady state or equilibrium, it's how, you know, how much of it went into solution. So it's not the speed, but it's the final endpoint, um, what percent is dissolved at the end. So both terms are measured as specific pH, ionic strength, and temperature, usually simulating um, intestinal fluid and body temperature. Um, dissolution testing is required for all solid oral drug products. And the way it works though is when something starts to dissolve, you, you get a layer of very concentrated drug um, that's dissolved around the tablet and that, diff and that diffuses into the bulk solution. So believe it or not, um, they, they have equations to define um, to find that whole process. So um, some drugs will have a different thickness of the that concentrated layer it might be different thickness depending on the drug um, and, and how fast the solution is agitated or how fast your GI tract might be churning that. So those things um, basic all together there's an equation to describe all that it's called the noise Whitney equation um, and that's on the next slide. So Noyes-Whitney equation says that the change in the drug concentration, and if you look down the bottom, it's all defined here. So I'm going to do this throughout the course. Um, if there's a new term, it should be, um, in every case, I tried my best to do that. It's going to be defined on the bottom. So change in the drug concentration, the bulk solvent, over change in time. So that means, you know, what is the change in concentration over time? In, in bulk solvent means this, the larger fluid, right? The large, not that thin layer around the tablet, but the larger bulk fluid, which would be in your GI tract. That would be like all the intestinal fluid, not directly surrounding the tablet. So change in concentration over change of time is equal to the diffusion rate constant. And every drug is different. You have to experimentally determine that for each drug. So that's how fast it diffuses. Um, what is the surface area of the particle because it sh at this point it should already be disintegrated when you're doing this so what is the surface area of the particle and obviously um, the, the, the larger the surface area and I don't mean the larger the volume of the particle but the more surface area um, the faster the dissolution okay and then that's going to be divided by the thickness of the stagnant layer so if you just kind of look at this knowing that that's on the denominator you should be able to figure out that if the the stagnant layer which is here is thicker it's a very thick you know stagnant layer that will reduce this that means it'll it'll be a slower diffusion out into this bulk fluid if this layer is thicker it'll take take longer and then that's multiplied by the concentration um, in the stagnant layer minus the concentration of the bulk fluid and hopefully that makes sense. So that means that if, if there's a larger difference here between CS and C, you'll have a more rapid dissolution. Um, so it's it's that whole idea um, of osmosis that if the concentration difference is much higher, then you have much faster uh, movement or dissolution um, out to there. So that means 
um, or it's very similar osmosis or like Le Chatelier's principle. You're kind of you can push it quicker by by putting more on one side, and if you put more so, uh, dissolved drug in the stagnant layer, it would more quickly push it into the bulk fluid. If you had, for instance, zero drug currently in the the bulk solvent, if there was nothing in here, it was just pure water, it would drive this much quicker, right? Because there's nothing in here yet. So there's there's a strong driving force in that case. So please understand, um, I'm not going to ask you to recite the equations. Um, in, in most cases, I will not. And I'll t if there's any case where I want you to memorize it, I'll tell you. But the default assumption I want you to have is that um, you don't have to memorize um, the equation from scratch, but you have to know how to use it and when you know when, what is used for. So, so the Noyes-Whitney equation, what is its purpose? And what, what do the terms mean? Right, and, and if you modify one of these terms, how will it affect the outcome of this dissolution rate? Okay, so um, I have some questions here. So, um, first of all, statement, reducing H, which is the thickness of the stagnant layer, would increase dissolution to the bulk solvent, right? So if I made this thinner, if I made this, this layer thinner, that would increase dissolution into the bulk solvent. So my question is um, just kind of a um, little bit of kind of thinking beyond this, but like how would, how, how might H be reduced? How might we reduce the thickness of the stagnant layer is my question. And I think I'll just answer that here. Um, and, uh, you know, you've had a few seconds to think about it. And it's not super complicated, but there's, there aren't too many things you can do. If you think about it, um, there's, there's not much you can do to change that. Um, but if you were able to agitate this or cause more motion here in this particle, that would move away the stagnant layer much quicker. So the, one of the best things you could do to accelerate um, the solution and, and thin this stagnant layer is as agitate the solution, right? So that would be, um, that would be basically just churning the stomach, for instance. It's not like we could control that very easily. Um, but, you know, if if we if your body, if, like from one person to another, if we did have a difference, a uh, difference in that uh, motion in the GI tract, that would affect the dissolution rate uh, in a positive way, right, if you had a faster motion. Decreasing C, right, or the drug concentration in the bulk solvent would also increase dissolution um, right, so decreasing C would increase dissolution. Like I said, so if this had pure water and nothing in it yet, right, C would be zero, and that would have a, uh, have a faster than dissolution and then diffusion out of there. So how would you decrease C? So if you imagine, just imagine we're in the small intestine or the the jejunum there, in the small intestine. What can we? What can happen in the small intestine that would? get rid of some drug particles in the bulk solution. And I think the, the obvious answer is if we absorb more drug. The more drug you absorb, the more of it's leaving this bulk solution, right? It's getting out of the, G, the GI tract, it's going into the portal vein, etc. And then more of it will come off of this stagnant layer. So it's kind of like that, it's called like a sink effect, where we pull it from here, it's going to drain some from here, from the stagnant layer. So a couple more questions. What might affect the diffusion rate constant, which is D? Remember, that's different for every drug. Um, really for every, even not just every active ingredient, but the different formulations might have a, a different diffusion rate constant. So question is, um, how, does, how can we modify that? And the higher the rate constant, the faster the diffusion, right, for the drug. So assume that the surrounding solvent um, or gastrointestinal fluid flow rate cannot be changed. I'm saying so you, you can't change the fluid around it, like that flow rate or the agitation of it. What else might, might we be able to do to affect the diffusion rate constant? So I want you to pause it right this right now, right this second. Okay, and then I'm gonna and, and now I'm gonna talk about it. Okay, so 
Um, what might affect the diffusion rate constant would be things like, um, for instance, if the drug were more hydrophilic, the actual active ingredient were more hydrophilic, it would likely diffuse faster. If it's more hydrophobic, it would diffuse slower. Okay. Um, if the excipients somehow repelled the drug, that could, you know, I'm just kind of thinking off the cuff, but anything like this can happen. If the excipients in the drug were not um, having affinity for each other, right, if they kind of repelled each other, that would facilitate that. Um, and other than that, there's not too much, not too much, but it's really almost, in most cases, based on the solubility in, you know, if something is charged or not. And the, the more charged it is, the more hydrophilic and usually the faster diffusion. So not too many factors there. What might affect the rate of drug absorption after dissolution? Okay, so now you can pause it. Okay, so the answer, one of the answers at least I could think of in terms of what might affect the drug rate, um, I'm sorry, the rate of drug absorption after dissolution would be um, same thing. Like, so we're talking usually lipophilicity. So if a drug is already dissolved, so we're assuming it's already dissolved, what would make it absorb faster? Usually we're talking about a more lipophilic drug will, will absorb faster if it's already in solution. Okay. Um, now there are some more complicated examples where there are drug, drug or nutrient transporters that might pump a drug in. Um, in that case, um, that would, it wouldn't necessarily require um, lipophilicity if it's handled by a drug transporter or something like that. Um, on the other hand, there are drug transporters that would p push the drug out of the intestinal cells and force it back into the GI lumen. Um, so that could impair absorption. So I talked about disintegration testing methods and I want to uh, spend a little bit of time talking about the dissolution um, testing methods. And right now we're focusing on in vitro, which means, um, you know, in a test tube technically or in a glass. So these are um, in, not in an, in an animal or human. So dissolu dissolution testing and drug release tests are performed in order to determine the best formulation, um, confirm that there's batch to batch reproducibility, establish drug stability and consistency release characteristics after storage. Um, that just means, you know, is what we tested in the beginning when the drug was first made, are those um, values that we've established, are those still the same after the drug is stored? Um, or, you know, does the drug clump up? Does it break down? Does anything change in storage? It's really essential to know that um, for the appro to know the appropriate storage conditions. To establish in vivo, in vitro correlations, and that's really important in the regulatory world where, um, for instance, if a generic company wants to market their drug quickly, they might try to avoid in vivo tests or human tests. They might try to go with just um, simple, more simple tests. And if you could establish this IVIVC, that's really helpful for them. So that that's basically saying we've proven that if this drug dissolves well in vitro uh, using this method, um, we've proven then that that means it's going to, to be absorbed well in vivo or have appropriate bioavailability in vivo, even though we haven't given it in vivo yet. Um, also to prove generic product performs as, or same as brand name. Um, like I said, you can sometimes use in vitro tests. Um, if you have a generic drug, remember the active ingredient has already been proven to be safe and effective. So the only question is, um, you know, is it, is it really absorbed to the same rate and extent as the brand name product? Um, so it could be equivalent. And sometimes they can, they can actually convince the FDA that it's good enough without going into human studies. Um, and it all depends on the drug. Um, a, lot of, a lot of different factors about the drug would be important there. So many different types of dissolution apparatuses exist. The USP dissolution test can be used for tablets, capsules, suppositories, suspensions, etc. Okay, so anything that you would normally have to wait to dissolve in the body or in the GI tract, you, you know, there are different tests developed for that that are um, standardized. 
um, by you know the U United States Pharmacopeia. USP apparatus one is a rotating basket. Um, apparatus two is a paddle that's kind of stirring the tablet in there or the dosage form. Those are those are usually used again for solid oral dosage forms. And we have these um, at the university. We have at least a paddle one, and, and again, um, last time I looked, it was in uh, lab SLC 347. There's uh, at least six of them in there, the six kind of beaker paddle apparatus. <clears throat> again, this is one of the more common ones, um, apparatus two, and you have, for instance, um, a certain RPMs you can choose or rotations per minute. You have this really large bath this for temperature control and then within that you have these kind of cylinders almost like capsules on the bottom because they're very really like like dome shaped these are also these are filled with also like a physiological fluid and again it's physiological it's got the right pH got the right electrolyte concentration it's got um, again the whole thing's the right temperature and these usually are metal metal or some kind of like Teflon or something paddle will rotate um, and it's that simple and you're going to put your dosage form in here and you just monitor for how fast it dissolves so it's not super complicated actually um, it's just kind of a, a very simple uh, type of motor that's, that's just moving um, and we have one again very similar to that in the lab actually um, you know there are some cert there are certain things that do have to be um, standardized here like I said I said all these things up the top we already talked about but the glass vessel and paddle are designed to minimize turbulence which could give in inconsistent results so there shouldn't be a lot of um, aggressive fluid motion or um, you know you, you guys probably all know what turbulence is but when the fluid doesn't move in a linear way but it moves in a kind of a random cir or circular way they're trying to avoid that and what I mean by circular is that if you push it in one direction and then it kind of it swirls around um, we don't really want to have those random turbulence effects we wanted to have a constant motion in one direction and the only purpose is that um, that it's consistent from batch to batch that we know that any differences in your result are not due to the equipment but due to a, a, an issue with the product itself with the drug product we have kind of a special device. We wanted to measure um, or simulate diffusion of topical drugs across the skin. There's something called a Franz diffusion cell where you would um, put at the top, you'd put like a cream or a lotion, then you have a, a thin membrane. Okay, and then you would, in the bottom, you'd have a solution. Now this says receptor solution, but it just receive all this is receiving the active ingredient from the top. It should go through the membrane and then appear in the bottom. And there's a port, so every once in a while, maybe every, you know, who knows, 10 minutes, half hour, whatever, you can pull out some, just a small amount of fluid and then analyze it uh, through many different me methods, but you can analyze it for that drug concentration to see how much got through there. And then you, you're just replacing, you're going to replace any lost fluid from the sampling, you replace it there, and usually you might want to account for that in your final calculation because um, you're diluting that. And then there's a, um, a stirring mechanism that's to simulate, almost like simulate blood flow, because this inside is kind of simulating the solution um, um, where it, you know, if, if a drug were on the skin, it's simulating what's happening after absorption. So it's going to be moving in the blood, and this up top would be um, this, like the top surface of the skin. We're going to have the cream or ointment or something like that, or, or lotion. It's really, really simple. Um, and it, and we've actually have seen Dr. Bomber to use this for one of his studies um, not too long ago. So if we have a special formulation that's enterocoded, um, we'll have to do special testing. And just to remind you that, that enterocoding is designed to not dissolve until it reaches the small intestine. So it won't dissolve in the stomach. And that is to either to protect the stomach or to protect the drug from the stomach acid. Um, so what they have to do is test in different pHs. And again, the tablet should not dissolve in acidic. It should dissolve maybe a little slower in neutral, 
than it would in uh, alkaline. So alkaline would be the fastest. Again, um, the main point is that it should not dissolve in the stomach acid. And, um, you know, the stomach can be anywhere from pH like 2 to 4 or um, sometimes higher if you're on an acid suppressive therapy. But I just have a simple animation here just showing that the rate is, um, there's no dissolution in acid, there's slow dissolution in neutral, and there's fast dissolution in basic and just a simple animation. <clears throat> so please remember what the purpose is of enterocoding. And um, probably not the most pleasant image because it reminds me of having to get up early uh, for 8 a.m. classes and things like that. But um, um, also it reminds me of the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air for some reason. I don't, know if, I don't think that's the same. It might be the same picture uh, from that video. But um, that's just to remind you that um, basically, you know, it's never going to dissolve. It should never dissolve in acid. Uh, we've tested this in the lab. And terracotta products might sit there for days sometimes and, and not dissolve in an acidic environment, um, which which is nice if, if your purpose is to avoid a, uh, that dissolution in the stomach. So now on to the idea of in vitro and vivo correlation. Okay, so the idea is um, that you want to predict drug bioavailability in the blood based on in vitro tests. So if we can use in vitro tests to predict what's going to happen in a whole organism or, or human, um, that might allow us to avoid um, clinical tests. On, and usually this is for things that are um, they're already approved. Um, so you might be looking at developing a generic drug or maybe slightly modifying a dosage form for a drug that's already approved. So we should already know that the active ingredient is safe and effective. So the strongest uh, evidence would be if the basically if the percent dissolved in vitro um, it has a, a correlation, a very strong correlation with the percent absorbed in vivo. If you can prove that correlation in you know, it's very consistent, then you should be able to just measure the percent dissolved in vitro per, like per unit time or, or after a certain amount of time and then be able to predict how much will be absorbed in vivo. And if you prove that you know, that's very, very um, reproducible, then you could probably just, in many cases, submit this to the FDA on the x-axis and just do that test and not do the in vivo test. Um, and that's the strongest, which would be considered um, the level A, right? That's the level A in vitro in vivo correlation. And that's the best correlation you can get um, for you know, regulatory purposes. A little bit weaker would be um, some of the other levels in level C. Um, level C would be basically saying, uh, looking at the C max versus the percent dissolved in a given time. Okay, so percent, percent, dissolve, percent dissolved at time X compared to the C max. Um, because the CMAX is only looking at one time point, so it's a little bit weaker evidence. Um, I don't want you to memorize too much here. Understand, though, what, what the purpose is for an in vitro and vivo correlation. The purpose is to correlate um, non-human and non-animal testing, just in vitro testing, with uh, what would happen in vivo or in the human. And the whole idea is to avoid having to constantly do um, clinical trials when all we want to do is prove that the drug will be absorbed um, be absorbed to the same rate and extent as another formulation or our brand name for instance um, this is also in your learning objective is the biopharmaceutical uh, drug classification system um, it's a simple classification system that, de that defines um, there's just four categories um, where a drug will have different levels of solubility or permeability. And what it means is that, remember, so, so two of the main factors for drug absorption are it has to be dissolved and then it has to cross the intestinal membrane. It has to be uh, absorbed, which is the, the permeability. So drugs that have high permeability and high solubility will be class one. Okay. And in a lot of cases, you, you have you, you basically are allowed to do less in vivo testing, particularly for generic products. 
you can in a lot of cases do less in vivo testing for drugs that have uh, desirable BCS classifications like class 1 okay um, so again the FDA might issue a waiver for in vivo bioequivalent studies for a lot of BCS class 1 drugs um, and I think I have something missing there but it just means due to their predictability they're very predictable in rapid dissolution and absorption um, whereas ones that are very low solubility and low permeability they usually have to have more evidence before they're approved as a generic drug and BCS classification is only for oral immediate release formulations um, because the the solubility of a you know basically the solubility of a delayed release or extended release and things like that they're not applicable in this case we're just talking about something as soon as you administer it you know it should start to um, dissolve because that's considered immediate release so it's important to understand that um, you know if you're comparing generic and brand name drugs that the methods that are used to perform the in vitro dissolution um, and drug release testing um, the conditions that are used or the methods that are used um, can affect your conclusion so for example here if we studied um, two drugs that you know if we were trying to get equivalence prove equivalence and we only dissolve them in water we'd show in, the, in this study we probably conclude that they're almost definitely not bioequivalent um, because they're not dissolved at the same rate and extent however if we did this test in acid we get almost the same curves and um, if we basically used um, a pH 7.4 uh, phosphate buffer okay um, so basically I think they acidified this and then they buffered it um, and raised the pH up to 7.4 at that point so what they found is pretty similar but not identical but then if you went with a pH uh, 5.4 phosphate buffer which is a, a more acidic phosphate buffer you get a very different result and that's probably due to um, you know something in the excipients that are changing the release for the release rate and things like that so the main point is that um, the, the conditions that you're using might change your conclusion so it's very important for these uh, generic drug companies to test in multiple different conditions right these generic companies have to test all these different conditions and they really have to show that that there's consistency um, and with the two different products the brand generic product in these different situations so and the, re the reason why that's important is because remember some of these um, well all these will go through the stomach and then through the small intestine and remember the stomach is more acidic the small intestine is more alkaline so just because okay so we get great consistency up here but then if it gets to the small intestine it might be a little different right but then if it's in between right whereas you know the small intestine is usually like six to eight um, probably closer to the pH six so that's actually in between these two so the whole point is that just because the dissolution is the same in the stomach doesn't mean it's going to be the same in the small intestine and they need to, to test all those conditions to show that the, those drugs are equivalent and the of course the ultimate test is if you give it to a patient um, how fast does it get into the blood and to what extent okay but in, um, they can't really they can't get a waiver for those clinical st studies unless they prove that that in all these conditions that these these drug products perform the same okay so I just have a few learning assessment and application questions here um, the second one is going to be a little bit um, dependent on your kind of memory of um, physiology on the other two we kind of just talked about so what are the two rate limiting steps possible in the oral absorption of a solid drug product um, which one would you apply to a soluble drug okay so you could also think of three steps that we talked about but you can bunch the first two kind of into one if you want so um, the two rate limiting steps would really be drug release and dissolution okay um, and then absorption so you could also say disintegration then dissolution then absorption um, as three steps if you'd like um, highly soluble products are limited by the absorption rate 
Okay, so if something is very soluble, the rate, the idea is the rate limiting step is not going to be the dissolution; it's going to be the absorption, right? Because it's already dissolving very rapidly, so then it'll kind of be st stuck or trapped in the GI tract um, while it's getting absorbed. Where are oral drugs absorbed, and by what mechanism? Again, we, we alluded to it, but I'm going to cover more of that physiology again um, of drug absorption um, in the next section. So it's kind of like just a precursor to that. So the answer is the duodenum and jejunum. The jejunum probably does most, but depending on the reference you look at, they'll mention the duodenum. So the duodenum can absorb some drug. Um, the jejunum is much longer, has much more surface area. So that's a, a large percent as well. Um, and it is mostly passive diffusion, believe it or not. So it's mostly through just diffusion right in, into the membrane. Of all oral dosage forms, what type do you think would get the fastest absorption? Right, and this one's pretty simple if you think about it. Um, if we could remove the rate, some of the rate limiting steps, we could speed up the whole process. And that would be, um, if we remove this integration and we remove dissolution, if we provide something in liquid form, right, that should give the fastest absorption um, if all else is equal, like the lipophilicity of the active ingredient and things like that. Okay, so one more application question. How could a drug that is unstable in acid be formulated uh, to have good bioavailability? And then give one example of an excipient that would accomplish this. We really only covered one excipient that would accomplish this. So again, how could a drug that is unstable in acid be formulated to have a good good bioavailability? So the whole point is that we have to avoid acid, um, avoid the effects of that acid, and how could we do that? And there's only one real thing that we talked about that would accomplish that, and we just talked about that recently in the slideshow, and that was the enteric coating, right? If we can enteric coat something uh, will prevent it from dissolving in acid. Um, and the enteric coating is, remember that's an excipient. It's, it's, a, it's not the active ingredient. So that will protect the active ingredient, which will be inside the formulation. So again, it's enteric coating. Um, the main one that we talked about, is really the only one that we talked about is cellulose acetate phthalate. Um, it's only soluble at neutral or basic pH. And this is what it looks like. And I think I have blanks in the student version or your version. So this would be cellulose acetate phthalate. <clears throat> and the question down here is, what part of cellulose acetate phthalate is responsible for its solubility in base and why? So this is going to um, require just a tiny bit of chemistry knowledge. Um, and this is the structure of it. It's a polymer. Or it's multiple units repeating. The cellulose acetate phthalate in the R group is either um, just hydrogen, right, or this as kind of, um, what is that, an acetate type of group, um, or is that um, a cetyl group, or this phthalate group, okay, so basically cellulose, either acetate or phthalate, and what it is is it's a mixture. So some of these R's will be this structure, some of them will be the phthalate. And I wanted you to look at these for a second and, and try to think of, well, if one of these is responsible for this um, acid kind of resistance to di you know, dissolution in acid, which one would it be? And usually it's something that um, you know is going to be either deprotonated or protonated or, or some kind of um, it's got a functional group that could be modified by pH and and of course the only thing that's obvious here to me at least is this carboxylic acid in phthalate and because it is phthalate that means it's going to have an acid group that carboxylic acid um, like any carboxylic acid is protonated in a low pH or the stomach and if it's protonated it's uncharged so it's less soluble and then if you um, remove that proton, you'll give it a negative charge and you'll make it more soluble because it'll be more hydrophilic. And removing that proton would, re would require a neutral or alkaline pH because this is a weak acid. And that's the whole idea. So please understand at least um, for enteric coating, please at least understand this one excipient, cellulose acetate phthalate, and, and why it works. Because I think understanding why, why this chemistry works 
um, might make it a little easier to understand what an enteric coating's purpose is in the first place. Okay, so the second and last section of the absorption uh, slideshow is going to be physiological factors in drug absorption. So we're talking about passive diffusion versus carrier mediated transport, uh, fixed law of diffusion. Yes, the Henderson Hasselbach uh, equation and drug ionization. Uh, a brief review of, of gastrointestinal physiology, and then food and drug bioavailability, and how food affects that. Um, the le learning objectives are to describe, compare, and contrast passive diffusion in carrier mediated transport. Describe the factors that can increase or decrease drug diffusion across the cell membrane. And I do want you to use the Henderson Hasselbach equation to calculate ratio and percent of drug that is charged and uncharged when provided with drug PKA in the pH of the solution. And this seems simple maybe, but um, the actual the way the way you're going to calculate percent is just going to take a slight bit of additional thought in terms of the thought process to to understand what percent is going to how that's going to be um, calculated from the ratio of acid to base. Describe the partition hypothesis or ion trapping and how drugs may reach different concentrations in different tissues based on this ion trapping. Discuss how carrier mediated transporters can work against drug absorption. Um, even though some can work um, to promote drug absorption, the most common issue we see with drugs in, in, in real practice is some transporters would prevent drug absorption. And PGP or MDR1 is, is the typical one. Identify the most important anatomical sites of oral in rectal drug, drug absorption. Okay, um, and so I included rectal in here because we're talking about the GI tract. Okay, even though this is mostly an oral absorption lecture. Um, describe how pH differs throughout the GI tract and how it influences drug bioavailability. And we had this in physiology, so hopefully you remember a lot of that. Describe in general how food and beverages may influence drug bioavailability and describe special routes of absorption such as intranasal, inhalational, and topical versus transdermal. Okay, so my, my intention in this uh, lecture is to not go over the large numbers of different transporters that exist in cell membranes, but just kind of the general concept, concepts of diffusion versus carrier mediated transport. Absorption of oral drugs requires uh, drug movement across which is called transcellular or between which is paracellular, um, the intestinal cells. Okay, so one or the other. Both aspects of the cell membrane, and, and that means apical and basolateral, right? And you can see on the bottom, um, the apical aspect usually has the brush border, the basolateral doesn't have much of a brush border. Um, the apical is always, um, in, any case, in any situation, the apical membrane is gonna be um, facing the lumen or the center of if this were a whole tube, the apical would be, um, this would be in this, um, facing the fluid in the center of the tube and the basal lateral is on the outside of, of that cylinder. Okay, in, in every case really in the body. Um, many drugs can move uh, via passive diffusion, but some require transporters for adequate absorption, which is kind of rare. Um, a large percentage of drugs actually just use passive diffusion as their main mechanism of, of, of absorption. Um, and there's really, we have to achieve a good balance between hydrophilicity and lipophilicity. And that's because um, when drugs are formulated in a, to a, an oral form, they have to be hydrophilic enough to dissolve, but they have to be hydrophobic enough to cross the membrane. Um, so it's gotta be a balance. So the rate of transfer across membrane is typically called the flux. Um, usually uh, the, the letter J is used to indicate flux, and that's measured in mass per unit time. For example, um, nanograms per minute, milligrams per minute, et cetera, et cetera. The J or flux is influenced by the drug's concentration gradient and charge. So obvious, obviously the larger the difference in concentration from one side of the membrane to the other side, the faster it will move. And the charge has, a, has an influence as well, like I said. So um, 
Generally, neutral drugs are absorbed or diffused more easily into the membrane, um, and charged drugs are usually um, less likely to do that. Okay, so if you look on the diagram here, uh, a protonated weak acid is going to be neutral, so it has faster absorption. A deprotonated weak acid, um, particularly carboxylic acid, will be negatively charged, so it'll be repelled by this hydrophobic membrane, so you'll have less absorption. Um, the same idea holds true, except um, it's opposite, because a protonated weak base is charged, whereas a deprotonated weak base is uncharged. So it's just kind of the opposite, but um, we still have to achieve neutrality or neutral state to have maximum um, diffusion into the membrane and an absorption. And they're just, uh, I'm just showing you here to remind you that, right, there's going to be interstitial fluid first, right, after you absorb, and then you're going to get into the blood from there. Uh, so Fick's law of diffusion is, is specifically for passive diffusion. And if you look again on the bottom, there's the key. So Q is the mass of drug moved, T is time. So the change in the mass of drug moved over the change in time. Right, or just, just the mass of drug over, over time equals a diffusion coefficient. Remember that's unique for each different drug. The surface area of the membrane, uh, the lipid water partition coefficient, that's critical. And that's going to depend on the chemical makeup of the drug. Obviously, the, the more um, like lipophilic, um, the higher that value of K. And um, the le so the less charged the drug, the more lipophilic the higher the K, and that makes sense because it's on the top, so that would that would increase this um, massive drug per unit time the more lipophilic it is. And that's all this is assuming that the drug is already dissolved, so that's an important distinction or important uh, point to make. Um, this is after dissolution. So the H, again, is a th the membrane thickness, and the thicker the membrane, the the less drug getting through per unit time. Obviously, it's going to it's going to create a thick barrier and, re and reduce that um, absorption. And then always a concentration gradient. So if the concentration in the GI tract is much higher than the concentration in, uh, for example, the plasma, because we're talking about absorption into the, the portal vein plasma, um, if there's a larger difference here, that'll give us a higher absorption rate. Right, so the concentration gradient, if it's higher, there's faster absorption. So hopefully that, that's pretty simple to understand. Uh, so I want you to understand how to apply this equation. If I give you these terms, how would you calculate these things? This um, you know, fl uh, mass uh, of drug absorption per unit time, um, when we're talking about just passive diffusion here. Um, and you know, how would you change some of these terms? Okay, so one question is, based on this, how can we increase drug diffusion across the membrane? Okay, I want you to just I'm gonna I want you to pause it yourselves and think about that, and then I'm gonna talk about some some things we can do to change um, or increase drug diffusion specifically. Okay, so some of the things we can do to increase drug diffusion would be to um, basically, if we could um, de develop a drug to be more lipophilic. So that's going to be hard, right? right? If we, we don't want to, in some cases, we may not want to change the drug, right? We, of course, we don't want to change the chemical makeup of the drug if, it's, if we know that it's going to work on a specific target. So we may not be able to change that very much. We may not be able to change the surface area of the intestinal membrane. We definitely can't change that um, in a safe way right, um, the surface area or the thickness. So a lot of these things cannot be changed. Um, one thing that we can try to do is, is give a higher concentration in the GI tract, which would actually just be done by giving a higher dosage, right? Obviously a higher dosage would give, would give us a higher concentration in the GI tract, which would speed up the absorption, uh, specifically the mass per unit time. So we really, we really can't change a lot of these things, but there are going to be patients that might have variabilities here. So some patients may have um, a lower surface area, 
believe it or not, of their um, small intestinal membrane because they may have had bowel surgery. That can happen. Um, things like that. They can... Um, I mean, that's that's one of the only things, honestly. I mean, most of these things are consistent from, or or kind of a constant um, with the thickness of the membrane in the drug um, diffusion coefficient can't really be changed easily. Now, we might be able to change some excipients to change that to speed up the, the diffusion, but there's not much else you can do. Okay, so that's why I said the, the first one would really be increasing the concentration of drug in the GI lumen. The only way to do that is a higher dosage for the most part. Um, design the drug to be more lipid soluble. Well, we can't do that unless we change the, chem you know, the act actual chemical makeup of the drug. So we'd have to prove that that drug still binds to its target pharmacologically. And then the diffusion coefficient. Okay. So we can't really do much about that. Um, but the diffusion coefficient is inherent to the active pharmaceutical ingredient. It's also determined by temperature and viscosity. Okay, we can't change gastrointestinal temperature or easily change viscosity of the GI fluid. So that's kind of something that you can't really touch. Um, the only thing that's really easy to modify is the amount of drug in the GI lumen um, to begin with, right? The concentration there. So remember the K is the lipid water partition coefficient. The higher the K, the higher um, the amount of drug that would be in the lipid layer if we did a, again the octanol water partition test. So it also means you know the higher the K, the the more rapid the passive diffusion, right? So and also for a given drug, if it's less charged or uncharged, the K will be higher, right? If we make it neutral, um, the the amount that will go into the lipid layer will be higher that can speed up the absorption or diffusion. Uh, we could use a Henderson-Hasselbalch equation to calculate ratio of charge to uncharged drug for basic or acidic drugs. And I will um, ask you to, to use this equation. Um, I'll give it to you, but I'll ask you to use it. Okay, so for weak acid drugs, the pH equals the pKa plus log base 10 um, times the, that is times the ratio of a negative to HA, so that's deprotonated to protonated. So that if this were carboxylic acid, it would be COO negative to COOH ratio. Um, but that's how, you know, that would be calculating the pH, which we're not doing. You'll be given the pH. You'll be calculating the ratio. So if we manipulate this, we get um, the ratio of deprotonated to protonated equals 10 um, to the power of pH minus pKa. So I kind of just did that for you and that's that's what I would give you on a, a quiz or a test. I would give you this final equation on the right here. Um, weak base drugs, um, it's very similar except remember the, the B, um, the unprotonated or deprotonated base is neutral whereas the protonated base is charged. So that's the opposite there, the charged species on the, on the bottom here. When we manipulate that, we can get um, an equation so we can calculate the ratio of um, deprotonated to protonated or uncharged to charged, and that would be um, equaling 10 to the pH minus pKa. So it's really easy to calculate, but then um, remember that's going to give us the ratio that won't give us the percentage unless we, we do you know further calculation. So here's a practice question. Okay, and, and after I, I kind of read the question, I want you to pause it because um, I'm gonna reveal um, a step at a time. I'll reveal the, the, the way I kind of solved it. It's pretty simple, of course. But aspirin or acetyl salicylic acid is a weak acid with a pKa of 3.5. So that, that the fact that it's a weak acid is important for you to understand because that means that it is charged when it is deprotonated. It's a pKa of 3.5 and that's critical for that equation. What percent of aspirin will be neutral or again, um, neutral will be with a proton, right? Or protonated and you can see that up top here. When it has the proton, it's not charged or it's neutral. 
So what percent of aspirin will be neutral in the stomach if the pH of gastric fluid is 3.0? So, so I'm gonna, um, I want you to pause it right now and then do that on your own and then start it again. Okay, so I hope you paused it and tried that out. We're gonna continue right now. This is the equation that I just mentioned. Now first you had to know, do we use the acid or the base equation? Well, so I said it's a weak acid, right? So we have to use the um, acid equation, which is A and HA. The question was, what percent will be neutral? Well, you need to understand the neutrals on the bottom, okay? Because that is not charged, that's neutral. Right, and so I have that flashing there. So that's highlighting that that's what we're trying to solve. Um, that equals 10 to the 3.0 minus 3.5 because the pH is 3, I told you. The pKa is 3.5, so it's very simple. We get um, 0 0.32, and that's just the ratio. And I, it's important to understand that the ratio just means, really, it would be 0 0.32 divided by 1, right? 0 0.32 is the same as 0 0.32 divided by 1, so that would be on top for every 0 0.32 of A negative, there'd be one of HA. So we still don't have a percent yet, right? That's, this is gonna be a little, just a tiny bit more work, right? So for every one molecule of protonated HA, there's 3.2, or sorry, 0 0.32 of deprotonated. So to get the percent, we have to take, we, we don't have to know, we don't need an absolute amount or mass we still don't know the mass and we don't need to know that. We could assume any units, but as long as we put these together, we'll put the 0 0.32 plus one, right? And that would be our 1.32. So that's gonna be the de denominator because that's the total amount in this, if we look at this ratio, the total amount would be 1.32. And we're to take um, the one that we are trying to solve, which is neutral, which is the HA, and that would have been one, because 0 0.32 divided by one. So it'd be one divided by this, the quantity of 0 0.32 plus one times 100 to get percent, that gives us 75.8% of aspirin is in the neutral form or HA form. Um, and then you should be able to, to make one more jump from that and say, well, that means most of it will be more likely to undergo passive diffusion because it is neutral and it's not charged. So there's a good chance of significant absorption. Um, it just so happens that aspirin is one of the few drugs that can be absorbed right in the stomach. It doesn't have to go to the small intestine to be absorbed. And um, that's likely because it's PKA, um, well, it's PKA allows it to be very neutral um, in the, in the, because you know, the stomach acid is so acidic, um, the PKA, if you have stomach acid of two, almost all of this would be neutral. So you'd have very rapid absorption from the stomach. And again, that's pretty rare to have that for a drug. Another example is metformin. Metformin is, uh, used to be brand name glucophage, or glucophage XL, but that is a, a drug for diabetes still quite uh, frequently used. That is a weak base with a pKa of 11.5. The, the structure is here on the right. Um, in the presence of acid, we get an extra proton and give it a positive charge. In the presence of base or more basic than its uh, pKa, it's gonna be neutral. Um, so what percent of metformin will be charged in the small intestine if the pH is 6.5? I'm telling you it's a base, so we want to use the base equation. And we, we're going to start off just by getting the ratio of uh, protonated to deprotonated. Um, and and I'm gonna, I want you guys to pause it now and just finish that calculation. Okay, so I'm going to continue. Hopefully, um, if you haven't paused it, you should do so now and then continue that. But what we're going to do is just simply get this answer. And the question, I guess, is what, um, which one are we trying to solve here, or which one are we trying to figure out? So what percent of metformin will be charged in the small intestine? So charged is, of course, on the bottom. So I want to know the denominator, 
what percentage of that is that of the whole amount of metformin? Okay, so again, we're looking on the bottom. So 10 to the 6.5 minus 11.5 is 0 0.00001. And a really quick check you should do is that if you know the pH is much, much lower than the pKa of the drug, that means the answer has got to be really high or really low. Okay, and in this case, um, because right the pH is lower, we should push a bunch of protons onto that. So most of it should be charged. And if most of it is charged, if we look back at this ratio, if most of it is charged, that would mean this is really, really high on the bottom and this is really low on the top. That should give us a very low number. And that's why we got 0 0.00001. So a very, very large percentage of it is going to be charged. And that would limit passive diffusion, right? So for every one molecule of protonated metformin, there are 0 0.00001 molecules deprotonated. And that means 99.99% of metformin is in the charged form. So you might think, well, okay, if the small intestine is, is normally like six to seven, how do we even absorb metformin? And that's gonna be a good question. And hopefully you've been thinking about that. And the answer will be coming up. So metformin is mostly charged in the small intestine. So will it be absorbed by passive diffusion or carrier mediated transport? Well, we know it's absorbed because it works systemically. The chances of it diffusing should be fairly low because it's charged and it has a lot of hydrogen bond groups, uh, amines and things. So um, a lot of other nitrogen. So it's likely um, not gonna be diffusing at all. So it must use carrier mediated transport. So something must grab onto it and force it through that membrane. And that's gonna be the hydrophilic pocket in a transporter. So, so this is the point here is that some drugs do rely on active, active or you know, sometimes it's um, secondary active or tertiary active transport, but, but some form of carrier or, or protein to grab onto the drug and pull it in. And in this case, metformin can utilize um, different ones if you look on the left here. So we have SLC22A3, SLC29A4, and that's on the apical side of the intestinal lumen. And on the other side, we have SLC22A1, that's another transporter. And remember, these membranes are different in, in many cases, in, in many different respects. They will have different proteins, different transporters, etc. So if we were to block one of these, we might reduce the bioavailability of metformin, right? And that can happen in some cases, or there could be mutations in patients. So I have a, a brief animation here um, showing what happens. So the metformin, I'm showing, well, it was charged, so it couldn't, it couldn't just passively diffuse. So what does it do? It goes through a transporter. And that's just reminding you a little bit too much detail probably, but it's reminding you where it goes. It goes into the, um, you know, capillaries, then to the portal vein, right? Then to the liver. And I just want to remind you that most drugs do that, right? Just to, I'm going to keep reminding you that most drugs do, do go to the liver through the portal vein before they have a chance to get to the central vein and then the systemic blood. There's no guarantee that every molecule of metformin will get into these hepatocytes, but there's a high chance that many of them will because, um, because it's, you know, it's a very small blood vessel or sinusoid that allows um, very close proximity to these hepatocytes and diffusion into those. Okay, and, and this is showing that it could go on multiple different transporters. So I think now that we talked about uh, fluid pH and drug pKa, um, I think we can um, probably make more sense out of this um, phenomenon that your, your learning objectives called ion trapping. It's not uh, really common, but it is an important idea uh, or concept for you to understand. And before I get into the details, um, what ion trapping means is that a drug can get trapped and concentrated in a specific tissue or fluid 
because of its pKa and um, it's required then that the pHs in those the two different fluids that we're going to be talking about have to have different pHs and usually one of those fluids then would would trap the ion of this drug molecule and um, give you a higher concentration than the other compartment of the other tissue and in that means even if both tissues had an aque aqueous or watery fluid, um, the pH differences might change how much drug is in there. So just um, consider this scenario. Um, there's a weak base that has a pKa of 7.3. Because it's a weak base, um, it's going to be protonated when the pH is lower than the pKa. So weak base with a pKa of 7.3, a lower pH. What will happen is in the lower pH, it'll because it's a weak base, it'll have more positive charges, right? The amines will be protonated in a lower pH. So imagine if that were, for instance, breast milk, which has a pH of about 7.2, depending on the patient. Plasma has a pH of about 7.4. And again, the reason why this is not common is because most tissues have very similar pHs, but if you have a drug that falls in between in this 7.3 range, you can get it trapped because once it is ionized, it does not like to diffuse. So we've already talked about that, right? So it gets kind of stuck here. So if one tissue, so, so the, the general rule is that if one tissue has more ionized drug, it should contain more total drug because only the unionized drug can diffuse back and forth. So please understand, um, you know, what, what kind of situation would create ion trapping? So um, the idea is that the drug pKa has to be between the essentially between the pHs of the of the compartments, right? And the, the two compartments have to have different pHs. And understand that ionization in one compartment more than the other uh, would result in trapping in that drug again in the ion, more ionized compartment. And that's that's the whole idea. So it's it's really practical because um, some cases if you measure the the plasma concentration of a drug in a, um, a nursing or lactating woman, you may not accurately get the, the concentration in breast milk. And that's why we have some drugs that are, um, you know, potential higher risk in lactation because they're um, potentially concentrated in the breast milk. So it's a very practical idea. And, but you know, the, it's really, it's really um, a real phenomenon. So important to understand that. So I wanted to get back on the idea of carrier mediated transport. Um, we, t we talked about metformin, um, but there are many other examples where transporters are going to be relevant. Um, transporters are present, of course, throughout the body in barrier membranes, um, such as the ones here. But the main differences between carrier mediated transport and passive diffusion, um, are, they're all listed on, the, the main ones are listed on this table below. I want you to understand these differences. So um, whereas carrier mediated transport is saturable, diffusion is generally not. And that means that you know, if we double the, just for an example, if we're talking about the gastrointestinal, um, um, ep the epithelial cell or enterocyte membrane, if we double the concentration of drug, we'll double the diffusion, mat, the mass diffused. If we triple the concentration, we triple the mass diffused. And that, that's pretty much gonna be almost unlimited for all intents and purposes, whereas transport because there's a limited number of transport proteins that is saturable. So sometimes we reach a point, for example, if we had too much metformin in the GI tract, um, we'd reach a point where that might get saturated in the, the, we wouldn't, if we double the concentration, we may not double the amount of absorption because we're gonna reach a limit. Because those transporters take time to move each molecule one at a time, right? They're actually, um, it's like manually you know, like manually loading um, something if you're like, you know, in an assembly line, if you're doing it manually versus versus like kind of an automatic flow. Um, so the idea is you have to grab, the transporters have to grab on and move it. So it takes time. Um, which one moves charged drugs? Well, charged drugs are, are very poorly um, diffusible, so they don't diffuse much, whereas um, transporters are usually handling the charged drugs. Right, active or passive, transport could be either. Diffusion is passive, okay? If you wanted to be technical about it, 
every motion is tied to energy one way or another um, but we're talking about ATP uh, hydrolysis and transporters could directly use ATP and have an enzymatic domain or they could be indirectly coupled to energy. Um, are there different mechanisms on each aspect of the cell mem membrane for transport? Yeah, there's usually different transporters on the apical membrane than on the basolateral membrane, whereas diffusion, the membrane's pretty similar in terms of lipid content um, and just the ability to diffuse is pretty consistent. So what is, so what is saturability um, specifically? What does that look like? How can we test for transport versus simple membrane diffusion? Um, and, and how do we see saturability on a graph? So here's a, th a hypothetical experiment. If a drug is applied to the apical or luminal side of the intestine in separate experiments at increasing concentrations. So imagine experiment one, experiment two, three, four. We try different concentrations. And then the drug concentration is then measured in the fluid on the basal lateral side or the other side of the membrane. Um, we plot this and then we see if the rate of drug absorption reaches a maximum. So this, remember this is critical, this is the rate. So you have to understand that. That means milligrams per minute, um, you know, micrograms per minute, right? That is not the total amount absorbed, but the speed at which is absorbed. So if you, if you, for instance, if you double the concentration and that doubles the speed, and that happens pretty much indefinitely, no matter how high you go, then that means we're not saturating anything because it's compensating for the concentration. And that's, that's considered non-saturable and that should be diffusion. However, if we get to a certain point where we increase the drug concentration and the rate does not change anymore. So if this were, if this were five milligrams per minute and then we went up higher and then it was 10, but then we went up higher with the concentration is still 10. That means there's more drug in the lumen, but there's, there's no more getting absorbed per unit time. So those transporters are absolutely congested and saturated with drug. Okay, so of course, any time that you get a plateau or a flattening point, that's what's indicating um, transport, not the line, right? So it's, it's really, I think it's important to understand the difference there. Um, it's also under, um, important to understand that carrier mediated transport can work against absorption. Um, I just wanted to, to highlight to two terms here. Uh, in the transport realm, we talk about efflux and influx. Influx is a drug or a molecule going into a cell. Efflux is when it's leaving a cell. Okay, so what happens in, um, in some cases is a drug, if it were on the luminal side, Right, if if that were something that you ingested and is still in the with the chyme in the intestine, it might go in to the enterocyte and they get pushed right back out. And one of the the mechanisms is through P glycoprotein or MDR1, and there's a couple other ones that do that as well. Um, so drug efflux back into the lumen is going to to give us poor bioavailability or limit our bioavailability in some cases. Now imagine if we blocked this with another drug or if this were mutated and not functioning and then it couldn't push the drug back out. So then we actually get higher bioavailability. So this ha actually happens in real patients where there are drug interactions on peak lycoprotein, um, which is also called MDR1, which is also called ABCB1. Um, and, the, and the technical gene name would be ABCB1 in the um, gene databases and things like that. Um, so digoxin is a cardio drug that's actually um, susceptible to this transporter, um, limiting its bioavailability. Because so if you if you draw if you block PGP, you can um, increase digoxin toxicity. So that's it's really um, clinically relevant kind of stuff. Um, so one of the cooler things that I think um, in terms of transporters that, that I think I've seen is that some some drugs will utilize nutrient transporters for absorption. Um, it's not super common, but drugs like um, Neurontin or Gabapentin um, for nerve pain, methyl dopa for blood pressure, baclofen for muscle pain or um, to uh, reduce muscle spasms. And then um, 
so those are all handled by amino acid transporters. Um, some of these um, three antibiotics and then an ACE inhibitor handled by a peptide transporter, aspirin or just salicylate, and then a statin handled by a mono, monocarboxylate transporter. So there are drugs that are charged, um, some, to some extent they're charged in the GI tract, um, so, so some of their absorption is not through diffusion, some of it is through um, transport. So it's interesting, they actually utilize nutrient transporters. So um, the whole idea is that or our transporters do not exist because we invented drugs. Keep that in mind, like because drugs in in the the grand scheme of of evolution um, or or humans' existence on the planet, drugs have been around for a very brief period of time. Um, you know, synthetic medications in particular. So transporters um, were encoded, you know, long before medications were developed. So why do they exist? Of course, transporters originally evolved or exist for several reasons. Some of them are to absorb nutrients. Another reason is to remove toxins. So that's why PGP exists in, in most people's, most um, the experts' opinion. PGP exists to remove toxins. So um, PGP doesn't have a brain, so it might perceive a, a drug as a toxin and pump it back out. Right. Whereas a nutrient absor a nutrient transporter might look at a drug and think, well, that well that looks like a peptide. I better absorb that. So um, they're hijacking these these transporters that already exist in some cases, which is it's really interesting. So now I just want to go over a brief review of the anatomical sites for oral drug absorption. I don't want to spend a lot of time because this is really mostly physiology. Um, drugs to be absorbed. Um, Rarely, but some of them are absorbed in the oral cavity. Uh, again, buccal would be cheek, sublingual is under the tongue, and nitroglycerin is, is the example, common example for sublingual administration for chest pain. Stomach, very rare, but aspirin is one of them that's absorbed there. Small intestine would be most drugs, and the duodenum and jejunum, and the large intestine, very rare that drugs have much absorption in the large intestine. Um, again, um, so we're going to go one at a time just briefly though. The oral cavity, um, the most important properties of the oral cavity are that it's highly vascularized, so a lot of blood vessels. has a very thin epithelial layer, so unlike your skin, um, the mucous membrane in the or mucosa is pretty thin. It has a lipophilic plasma membrane like all barrier tissues. So if we can get a lipophilic drug to disintegrate in the oral cavity, you usually get very rapid absorption. Again, that's the example, we, uh, a good one is nitroglycerin. So very few drugs are given this way, but some of them, um, you know, very important purposes like chest pain. Um, so remember the oral cavity is not used by the body to absorb nutrients. We don't absorb nutrients in our cheek, right? So it's capillaries do not go to the portal vein or liver um, they go directly to the systemic circulation. So if you understand, I mean, it's just trying to connect that. If you understand what the oral cavity normally does, it does not absorb nutrients. So it also, when it absorbs drugs, if you assume a drug is like a nutrient um, from the body's perspective, it handles it like that. It does not go to the liver and it goes straight to the systemic bloodstream. So it bypasses the liver. That's one of the most important points is that um, oral mucosal administration avoids first pass metabolism by the liver. So now the stomach. Um, the most important factor about the stomach is not drug absorption, but rather um, how will the pH affect a drug? Um, the low pH may destroy some drugs, so ha they have to be protected with an enteric coating. Um, if someone is on an acid suppressive drug like a, a proton pump inhibitor or an antacid, um, the change in the pH, that may affect drug bioavailability um, due to more or less uh, rapid dissolution or it might alter the stability of the active pharmaceutical ingredient. So it's really important to understand that changing the pH of the stomach may affect other drugs, um, particularly their stability and their absorption. Okay, so um, again, one final thing is that drugs that are enteric coated 
um, imagine a scenario where if there's an enteric-coated drug, but someone is also on an acid suppressive therapy, so then that, that stomach becomes neutral or alkaline, yeah, that enteric coating would dissolve earlier or prematurely in the stomach. That may matter and it may not, because if you were originally protecting it from the acidic stomach, but then it dissolves, um, it may not matter because it dissolved because the stomach is no longer acidic. So it may not cause any problems, right? Because the stomach is neutral. Um, it all depends. However, if the drug is an irritant to the stomach, then maybe that is a problem to prematurely dissolve that drug. Um, now, this, this is kind of the workhorse. The small intestine absorbs most drugs. The duodenum is short, much shorter than the jejunum, and receives, of course, the digestive juices from the pancreas and the liver. Um, juna, the jejunum is very, very long compared to the duodenum. Um, they both do contribute to drug absorption, but the jejunum has probably the largest role. Uh, the small intestinal transit time is about three to four hours. So if a drug cannot be absorbed within three to four hours, once it reaches the small intestine, uh, generally at that point, the rest of it will probably not be absorbed. So that's the, the kind of window of opportunity um, for a drug to get absorbed. Otherwise, it'll go into the colon, probably not get absorbed, and then be eliminated fecally as the parent compound. So this slide is just showing that the small intestine really has the greatest surface area in the GI tract. And that's not only because the small intestine is long, it's because it has folds on folds on folds. So it has, um, remember the, I don't know if you remember from physiology, the plica circularis, or basically these folds, um, you're gonna see these kind of blue ones here, light blue, um, and those are permanent folds in the small intestine. And then you have smaller folds, and then you have kind of, um, essentially villi and then microvilli. So there's multiple levels where the surface is made larger and larger and larger, and that's the whole idea. So the surface area, um, if you compare it to just a cylinder, a straight smooth cylinder, um, the surface area, if you go all the way down, is up to 600 times more than the surface area of just this kind of a straight smooth cylinder. So it's, it's a huge, surface area. So even if a drug is uh, poorly diffusing, there's so many opportunities for it to diffuse that it might still get to a, a you know a concentration that's effective. You may, re may remember a lot of the digestive enzymes coming from the pancreas and, and um, some of the things are coming from the liver. And that's the reason why most protein drugs cannot be administered orally. Um, they're degraded by trypsin, chymotrypsin, carboxypeptidases. Um, so if, if we didn't have those enzymes and we administered a protein drug, um, the drug would probably not be destroyed. Now, it might be too large to be absorbed regardless. Um, bile salts from the liver can aid in dissolving lipophilic drugs. Um, so, you know, someone's uh, gallbladder function may actually affect drug absorption because of the ability to dissolve the, any kind of lipophilic drugs. Most small, uh, small intestine absorbed drugs go to the liver through the portal vein, okay? Some very lipophilic drugs, um, remember, a higher the, log, the higher the log P, the more lipophilicity. So if it's positive, it's more lipophilic and less hydrophilic. So very high log P, uh, which is very high lipophilicity, um, is really interesting because this may follow fatty acids. So remember I said most drugs go through the portal vein. Um, drugs that are very, very lipophilic, they may not go to the portal vein. They may go and follow fatty acids. And this requires knowledge of that physiology that we had. Um, the fatty acids, remember they get um, into lacteals in the lymphatics, packaged into chylomicrons. So very lipophilic drugs can sometimes bypass the liver by going into chylomicrons. Um, even though they're administered orally. So it's really interesting. So we're nearing the end of the GI tract. Um, we're in the colon now. The colon has actually no villi, so it has a very low surface area compared to the small intestine. Um, remember, the main purpose of the colon is to store and desiccate the final stool. 
Um, and there are, you know, there are a small number of nutrients absorbed there. But most drugs are not absorbed there. Most of them are in the small intestine there. Um, a couple of them are, and you don't have to commit this to memory, um, one of them is metoprolol for blood pressure. But um, I just want you to understand the vast majority are not absorbed by the colon. You should understand that the colon has a lot more uh, bacteria than the small intestine. And sometimes those bacteria can can actually be utilized um, strategically to to liberate drugs from the dosage form. Certain drugs are designed to only be um, active once they reach the colon because they're they're actually metabolized by, by bacteria. Um, so just understand that the normal flora um, is much more dominant um, once you're past the ileocecal valve and you're in the, the whole colon there. So uh, I know this lecture is on um, the oral routes of uh, drug absorption, but I wanted to include the rectum because it's um, part of the GI tract and of course suppositories are administered that way. Um, something, you know, I think I talked about it in physiology uh, last year, but something that's really important is that, um, you know, remember the very outside, um, you know, as soon as you start to get into the rectum, it's very, um, it's very different because on the very outside there, you're it's not really gastrointestinal tissue it's almost like a skin so if something is not delivered far enough it will go to the bloodstream and bypass the liver however if something is given like further into the rectum it will go in in like just like any oral dosage form it'll end up uh, the majority of those drugs will end up going to the liver through the portal vein so it just think of it as transitioning from non-GI tract to GI tract. And once you're in the actual GI tract, it's, it's at that point, then most things are, will go to the liver. So um, if you want to avoid first pass metabolism, something would be given more superficially or, or less deep um, into that area. So, you know, so if, if a patient, you know, patient to patient, if they vary with their technique, some of them may get more hepatic metabolism, some get, may get less depending on the depth of administration there. Okay, so um, it's probably not something people normally think about, but it's it's kind of practical knowledge. So um, there's a chance you'll remember this, this exact image from gastrointestinal physiology that I taught. Um, but, you know, even though that was, you know, we've already taught it, I think it's really important to bring it up again because we're talking about um, the factors in the GI tract that affect drug absorption. So, um, you know, believe it or not, you'll hear a lot of people say a lot of different things about the pHs in the different parts of the GI tract. A lot of people say the small intestine is really alkaline, um, but it depends on your, your standard of comparison because the small intestine is not as alkaline as the blood, believe it or not, um, but it is more alkaline than the stomach. So um, the real ranges that you'll find, and, and I've looked through several references to, to to get an idea of the real real ranges here, and, and the oral cavity is close to seven, the esophagus is close to five, you know, between five and six. The stomach can can rare, rarely get down to one, but it can, so it's pH one to five. And then once you're in the small intestine, things don't change very much. You know, the, the terminal ileum is a little alkaline. The large intestine is back to being between six and seven. So, so the, the main point here is that if you have an enteric coated drug and you know you're not on any acid suppressive therapy then yeah that drug will be um it will, will not be getting dissolved in the stomach and as soon as you reach the small intestine um it'll it'll be free to to dissolve and be liberated so there's really not much we can do here in the in the, in the small intestine and the colon we can't really take advantage of any major differences in pH with dosage forms because the, the pHs are all pretty similar. So things that are enterocoded, we can't really make them dissolve later on. So if we want to make something dissolve in the colon, we generally wouldn't use a pH dependent system. We would use a very um, slow dissolving, like a slow release system, which is a little different. Or again, the colon specific chemistry um, that would be you know, metabolized by bacteria to, to, in some cases, activate a drug. 
So please please understand the, the general trends. So like where are we most acidic? Where are we um, kind of generally neutral, close to neutral alkaline? And that would be, you know, all the intestines. And um, just, just a general idea. And please understand the reason why these pHs can be so different is because we have um, valves or sphincters. So we have the lower esophageal sphincter, the pyloric sphincter, and then down in the colon we have the ileocecal valve. I'm actually between the small intestine and the colon. So if we didn't have those those sphincters or valves, we wouldn't be able to have a real separation of the fluid. Um, and, and remember, each organ is going to have different secretions. So the stomach will have protons. The small intestine will have um, bicarbonate. And that's why that is more alkaline than the stomach. Um, so all these can affect drug absorption and um, you know disintegration, etc. So the next five slides or so will be on the effects of food um, and beverages on oral drug absorption. Um, food has you know a very large role in, in bioavailability for certain drugs. pH could be affected by food and beverages. Um, that's probably not the biggest concern. Um, lipid and Bile salt concentration in the small intestinal lumen is important. First of all, um, fatty foods or beverages will promote the gallbladder to, you know, pump that the bile salts out and promote the liver to make more bile. And those bile salts, remember, those are um, amphiphilic, so part of them are charged, part of them are, are nonpolar, and that allows us to emulsify fats much quicker. And if our drug is fatty, that'll help help to dissolve the drug. Likewise, just the meal itself, or fatty beverage like uh, cream or something like that, um, you know, or or, a, or an alcoholic beverage that has something kind of like a, you know, cream or coconut, um, something like that. Essentially, with fat in it, that can increase dissolution of, of a lipophilic drug by itself. So the, the actual lipid in the food can increase drug dissolution or the bile salts can do that. Gastric emptying is affected um, by the type of meal you have. Solid meals that take longer to digest, of course, will take longer to, um, you know, th that'll take longer to have gastric emptying if you have a, a solid meal. And if the drug is incorporated into that solid meal, then of course the drug absorption might be delayed because of delayed um, drug presence in the small intestine. Liquids appear in the small intestine much earlier, um, much, much earlier. So if you, know, if you have a drug with only liquid, um, there's a, a much, in most cases, you'll have a higher chance of dissolving that drug and getting it, um, get the absorption process um, started quicker. Splanchnic blood flow, remember splanchnic vessels are the same as the mesenteric uh, arteries and capillaries. Um, that blood flow is increased by a meal. So a certain amount of food uh, might, you know, in some cases that can actually promote drug absorption because there's more blood flowing to the gastrointestinal system that can pull the drug um, and absorb, you know, and get it out of there quicker um, to then pull more out of the, remember we talked about the and the particles, we have that stagnant layer. We could pull pull more drug and diffuse more out of there if we pull more into the blood and, and get it away. So, so you know, the, the same reason why you get ex, extra blood flow um, after a meal is why you, you basically get that, um, why you'll get more drug absorption in that case. And that, that means, right, because when you're, you're eating a meal, you get more blood flow to absorb those nutrients. So we're going to do, the drugs are going to be treated just kind of like the nutrients in a sense. And then drug metabolizing enzyme activity um, will be discussed mostly in another lecture um, coming up fairly soon. And then um, <clears throat> I have some other things on here um, related. So just one thing I wanted to point out is this uh, related to that is the grapefruit. Um, grapefruit juice is a very common um, yeah, you know, it's a common reason for for drug food interactions or common cause of drug food interactions because it affects certain drug metabolizing enzymes. That we're gonna, you know, again, we're gonna talk about those later on. Okay, so and then we're gonna go ahead and move on to the next one. So these are some examples um, 
of what food will do to specific drugs. Um, you don't have to memorize these, but I wanted to give the examples uh, because it might be a while before you end up, you know, seeing these later on in the curriculum. Um, so, you know, for example, you can get decreased bioavailability of these drugs, um, atorvastatin, um, which is brand name Lipitor, and then Plavix or Clopidogrel. Um, food decreases rate and extent of atorvastatin um, by, well, 25% rate and 99% extent. Food decreases the Cmax of one of the active metabolites, or they were the main active metabolite of clopidogrel by 57%, which is really significant. And then increased bioavailability for, for example, oxycodone, which is a, a narcotic opioid, um, muscle relaxer, metaxalone, uh, a, um, an aldosterone antagonist, and then a, an antibiotic. So all these can increase um, bioavailability and in many cases, it's related to the lipophilicity of a drug and, and a high fatty meal. So for example, griseofulvin is a fairly lipophilic drug and a high fat meal increases the C-max. So there's so many things that you got to consider, um, you know, with other than just the dose of the drug, right? And many other things like these food factors. And I like this example because it's probably one of the more uh, pronounced ones. It's one of the, the ones that I remember as a student. Again, griseofulvin is a, a pretty old antibiotic, but it's still used from time to time. And um, that absorption, this is the absorption following a one gram oral dose. And what you find is that, um, and this is just the control. So the negative control, there's no drug. And then if we're fasting, we give the drug. This would be after eight hours, this would be our, our serum concentration. Um, high protein. Protein is a little effect, very little. But then as we, and this is, this is oleomargarine. So margarine is mostly plant fats. So that's what this is going to be. So it's, it's basically just adding um, this kind of purified plant fat. And I don't know, I don't remember if that was the same uh, oleomargarine or was it, was it just general, a generally fatty meal. But essentially the idea is the more fat, the more, um, you know, the higher the concentration in the serum. For, and griseofulvin is a really prominent one. So, um, I, the, and this is just kind of an off the cuff, um, just to, something to help you. But the way I always remember that is remember like on steak, if anyone eats steak is like the gristle, which is the fat. I don't know why that always reminded me of that. The griseofulvin, I think of this fatty drug that that is promoted, the absorption is promoted by fat. And, and if you just think about that, I think, Maybe you'll never forget that because I never did. Effective food, um, more effective food on drugs, um, erythromycin. Um, actually, erythromycin is mostly affected by water. Uh, water intake is very, has a very strong effect on uh, erythromycin absorption. And of course, that's an antibiotic. But um, if you look on the bottom here, these symbols are uh, carbohydrate, protein, and fat. Um, you know, changing what's in the diet didn't do much, but then when you went from um, no food or fasting with 20 milliliters of water or fluid, that was very different from 250 milliliters of fluid. So the drug is, you know, is, is the absorption is promoted very significantly by the amount of water you're taking with it. So when drugs say you don't take with a full glass of water, it might not just be to, um, you know, kind of make it you know, make it uh, more tolerable or, or something like that. In some cases, it, it's, it might be related to the absorption of the drug. Um, and now, and again, um, and I, I think I said that I would cover this later on, but what I meant was the, um, all the drug metabolism will be covered in a separate lecture, but um, I just want to focus briefly on, on the effects of grapefruit juice. Um, grapefruit juice, again, is one of the most common dietary substances associated with, associated with food drug interactions. Grapefruit juice contains naringin, which is a flavonoid, and then bergamotin, and that's my best pronunciation, I suppose. Um, that's a furanocoumarin. Okay. Um, those inhibit cytochrome P453A4, which I'm sure you, you've probably heard of, but you haven't really learned metabolism yet. 
So that's just an enzyme most prominently in the liver that metabolizes a, a very, very large number of drugs, probably, um, you know, 50 to 100 at least, many, many drugs. Um, but these substances in grapefruit juice inhibit it, and that means if you, if someone really goes on kind of like a grapefruit diet or is just, just loving it and having it all the time, in that case, there is a chance that it would be pretty significant, and then the drug metabolism be slowed so you'd have a potentially a higher concentration of that drug in the blood because it's not breaking down and potential toxicity um, this again this uh, this may appear to be more re related to drug elimination but on first pass metabolism inhibition of this enzyme will will increase drug bioavailability too so what I mean by that is because most drugs go to the liver when they're ingested um, so the amount that actually reaches the systemic circulation the very first time it's getting in the body, um, that will be re um, increased. And then as it circulates more and more, anytime it reaches the liver, then it'll have, again, a lower uh, lower metabolism rate, so higher, higher blood concentration. Okay, so we're going to wrap up the lecture um, with a few slides on um, special routes of drug absorption. And then just a few assessment questions. So uh, first is intranasal, and I won't spend a ton of time on this, but intranasal drugs have been used for many years, um, you know, for local effects, um, things such as decongestants um, for nasal congestion and sprays and things like that. Intranasal drugs for systemic effects are, are more difficult to develop, but there are examples out there. Um, and especially like if you had a, a protein-based drug, like they've tried insulin and it's been very, very difficult um, to, to get um, kind of a, a reliable or predictable effect. But obviously we have things like naloxone, um, intranasal naloxone, which is extremely effective for um, systemic effects, right, for opioid overdose. So there's some really good examples where it can work. Um, the nasal mucosa is really loaded with blood vessels. Uh, but it doesn't have a large surface area, and the residence time is very, uh, fairly short. Um, so that limits, you know, for if you wanted to absorb a large quantity of drug, it kind of is very limiting to do that. So you usually are limited to, to smaller amounts of, of drugs that, that don't need to reach a high concentration in the blood. So the ideal type of drug for intranasal use are somewhat lipophilic and small, uh, small molecules rather than proteins. Um, so again, um, naloxone is probably a good example of something somewhat lipophilic in a, a very small molecule compared to a protein. Dosage forms available are, um, so other things are drops, sprays, and nebulizers. Okay, um, nasal drops, well, they could be for multiple purposes. A lot of those are over the counter. Um, sprays, you've probably seen, and nebulizers are more unique because a nebulizer uses a large machine, a relatively large machine and um, it's it's kind of a constant flow of a mist that you're breathing in, which is it's very different from a spray or a drop, which is more manual. And again, I already mentioned naloxone. Um, one advantage specifically for this naloxone is that um, intranasal use, for the, the advantage of intranasal use is that the patient might be unconscious and not be breathing well or a very poor respiratory function, which is, you know, a case of an opioid overdose inability to swallow, but they still might get adequate drug absorption. And that's specifically because the, the nasal mucosa, the nasal mucosa still has blood supply, right? Even if you're not breathing well, even if you're not swallowing well, the nasal mucosa still has blood supply. And that's why certain drugs can still be effective like naloxone. So it's kind of interesting. So the next route is inhalational. Um, inhalational drugs, of course, are usually for pulmonary disorders. Um, and the typical example is, is an inhaler for asthma. However, inhaled insulin has been approved. Um, you know, it's, it hasn't been really widely used, um, but it's still kind of a groundbreaking invention because uh, insulin is a peptide, so it's a small protein, which means it's much, much larger than most um, small molecule drugs. So to get that absorbed through the nasal mucosa rather than like an IV, I'm sorry, not the nasal mucosa, but the, the pulmonary 
um, route or the epithelial route in the lungs, not the, sorry, not the nasal, but the lung uh, mucosa, that is quite challenging because, you know, you're not putting it directly into the blood and has to cross that membrane. Um, but the lungs do have a very large absorptive surface area, which, which is, of course, primarily for oxygen exchange and CO2. Um, particles should be a certain size, pretty pretty small size, three to five microns, to get the deepest lung deposition. So believe it or not, these drug companies that are making inhalers and things, they have an extreme, like they put an extreme, extremely high amount of time and, and effort into making the particle size exactly correct and testing the ideal particle size for each drug. Um, and every single inhaler, every unit of one of those, like that's sold, has to have the ability to produce the right particle size, which is really difficult. Um, but they figured it out. So um, larger particles deposit too far in the upper airways because if you think about it, they're, they're heavy and they don't necessarily follow the flow of air. So they'll, they'll just kind of hit against the back of the throat or the pharynx. Um, the small particles can follow the airflow, but if they're really tiny, like, you know, less than three microns, they could also be exhaled very easily too. So the, the sweet spot is between like three to five microns or micrometers, which is the same thing. So um, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but down on the bottom here, you'll see that um, there are, again, these are the insulin inhalers, Exubra and Afriza. Um, Exubra was approved in 2006, but it wasn't, you know, they had a very low sales related to cost, inconvenient device size or fears of pulmonary side effects. Pfizer actually abandoned it. It wasn't taken, it wasn't like forced off the market by the FDA. Pfizer abandoned this. As you can see, nowadays, you know, things are, we're trying to get smaller and smaller with devices. And this one is pretty darn big um, for, you know, for an inhaler, for an insulin. A Frieza is an inhaled insulin made by a company called Mankind that was approved in 2014. Um, it has a much more convenient size. Um, Sanofi was marketing that, but decided to stop due to low sales again. So it's interesting. Um, of course, they had to prove that it was effective to get um, to get it on the market, but they still had low sales, and I'm ge I'm guessing that's related to cost or trouble getting it covered by insurance. But but I wouldn't say the the story's over for these um, because if they've gotten them to be effective, that at some point that probably will be um, you know will be more popular than injections, right? So we'll see in the future. So this slide is just, just kind of showing you um, approximately where the different sized particles would deposit. So conducting airways, um, they would usually, you get um, a five to 10 micron particle kind of stopping there and getting stuck. And if you want to go all the way into the lung parenchyma, which you know, parenchyma, by the way, just to remind you, are just the main functional cell of that organ. So the um, the epithelial cells in the alveoli or the parenchyma, um, those are, again, if you if you can get a particle size from one to five microns, that'll fit and get into the parenchyma. Remember though, going under three might have a risk of exhalation. So that that's really the only point there. So I don't wanna to go too much into the anatomy there. Um, next is topical and transdermal. Topical means the drug is applied directly to the target and systemic exposure is not desired. The vehicle affects the topical onset of action and duration. Some examples are creams, lotions, liniments, ointments, gels, and foams. Um, what I mean by that is the vehicle, um, which is the, the diluent um, that, you know, whatever the drug is suspended or dissolved in, that can affect the onset of action and duration. So if something, um, for example, if a drug is lipophilic, but it's suspended in a um, hydrophilic base, that might repel the drug and, and promote it to be, you know, absorbed more quickly into the skin. Whereas if your drug is hydrophilic and your vehicle is hydrophilic, um, the drug might take longer. Um, and then and there's many other examples, and I don't want to get into too many of them now. Um, because those are, you know, something that you'll cover in pharmacotherapy, um, you know, kind of in special cases where you have to do that and probably a little bit in pharmaceutics. Um, transdermal is much more specific. Um, and that specifically means through the dermis 
and generally intended for systemic absorption. Patches are the most common example of transdermal drug administration, like a fentanyl patch. Um, I don't know if nicotine patches are used anymore. Um, they weren't super effective, but those used to be used a lot for transdermal administration of nicotine, for example. Um, so please, please understand that transdermal, even though it's on the skin, that, it, that is not topical, right? It's very different. Now, and I've been, honestly, I've been reading this for many years, maybe 10 years or more, but uh, several researchers are, researchers are investigating microneedles and other special transdermal delivery systems where drug absorption is enhanced. Um, you wouldn't believe this. There's so many things out there in the literature that people are trying, like heat, sound waves, electricity, or iontophoresis that's been going on for decades. But for some reason, most of these these methods are just not widely adopted. You don't really see a lot of this stuff out there. And I'm surprised the microneedles haven't been super popular, um, at least to my knowledge, because it's a way of um, getting a drug, um, you know, kind of like, for, for example, if you had a vaccine and a microneedle, you can get it uh, pretty far into the dermis without without drawing blood, without, you know, without needing to, to use a, a large a large needle. Um, so like small enough that it's not painful, but lo like large enough that, can, you know, and, and it'll go deep enough that it'll actually get, um, you know, into the bloodstream pretty quickly. Again, it hasn't been widely adopted yet. So finally, I have some learning assessment and application questions. Okay, and um, again, it, you always have the option. You can look at the PowerPoint slides and answer these um, well ahead of time or pause it. And um, please, uh, so please just understand kind of from this point on, it's always, it's always understood or implied that you should pause it after each one of these. So what drug property would increase the likelihood of using carrier mediated transport for absorption. So this is the example with metformin. So go ahead and pause it. Okay, so I'm gonna answer it now. So one of the, the main properties that would require carrier mediated transport is if a drug is charged. So if it's charged, it's not very lipophilic. It won't diffuse very well in many cases. So it has to use a transporter or it might not be absorbed at all. If an orally administered drug is transported by PGP, sorry, I'm going to move on. If an orally administered drug is transported by PGP, what would happen when a PGP inhibitor is given? Okay, so remember, PGP um, or MDR1 always pumps drugs out of the blood from, you know, so out of the blood in into the gastrointestinal lumen is one place. And there are other other organs like the kidney and the liver, but PGP in the intestine is right on the apical membrane. And as soon as a drug gets into the um, epithelial or the enterocyte, which is the epithelial cell, um, PGP can pump it right back out to where it started started and right back out into the lumen. So if we give a PGP inhibitor, um, we can actually enhance bioavailability by preventing drug efflux. Right, blocking PGP blocks drug efflux. So that could be a drug interaction that you know, raises the concentration of another drug, which could be toxic, um, you know, or it could enhance efficacy depending on, on the level that you get to. What GI absorption sites by, bypass the liver and result in drug entering the systemic circulation first? So how do we avoid first pass metabolism, um, specifically with GI absorption sites? First is the oral mucosa, so in the cheek or buccal and then sublingual. Next is very, very um, superficial or, or the furthest outside in the rectum. Okay, so, so not, not very far. That would be um, bypassing the liver. Other than that, that's it. I mean, it's, it's the very beginning of the GI tract and the very end of the GI tract would really be your only chance of, of bypassing the liver with GI, um, a GI administration route. How would an acidic stomach affect solubility of a weak-based drug? Okay, a weak-based drug would have an amine. In most cases, the amine is, um, right, it's gonna be, when it's protonated, it will be charged positively. And in order to protonate it, you have to have extra protons, which means acidic. So an acidic stomach, 
um, would protonate a weak base and make it uh, more soluble, right? Again, acidic stomach should make it more soluble. So let me reveal all these. Right, so those are all the answers. So this concludes this uh, probably close to a three hour lecture, um, but no fear, um, future lectures will, you know, there's gonna be some weeks where they're gonna be shorter, uh, maybe two hours, uh, maybe one hour. So, so it depends on the week and it's, it's gonna be, overall it's gonna be balanced to be, um, you know, to be the appropriate um, number of hours for the, for the whole course. Um, so future, the future lecture, the, or at least the next one will be on drug distribution and, um, and then we'll have a little bit of drug metabolism in another lecture after that. Um, so again, this is, I know it's a little large, um, but I think a lot of this stuff is going to be really useful for the future.